York City. Language access implementation plans. The impact of the proposed public charge rule on New York City. And the other public hearing we held was on the need for legal representation in immigration courts under Trump. We covered many topics, but we do not see these issues addressed in the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget. However, the preliminary budget does include 25 million for the NYC CARE program, which proposes to increase access to the city's public health insurance option, Metro Plus, and ensuring that anyone inel ineligible for insurance has direct access to services at H&H &H locations. While this is a step in the right direction, we still, we, we still do not see baseline funding for adult literacy and the immigrant health initiative items that the council has been fighting to add into the adopted budget every single year. We also need additional funding to support census 2020 work, including dedicated funding for the community-based organizations who will be on the ground driving this grassroots effort. And they are the ones that are gonna know the hard to reach New Yorkers, our CBOs. They know our communities best and they're the ones that are holding the trust in our city of New York. Additionally, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs recently released its second annual report that I just mentioned. And while this report indicates that there are increased needs facing our immigrant communities, there are no new asks that the Mayor has made. There are no new asks in this budget. And so how is this possible? Robust funding is essential for tackling inequality and building stability for our immigrant families. If we are to ensure that New York City is a true sanctuary city, and I know that that struggle is on a daily basis something that we do, we struggle towards a sanctuary city. And this commitment must be reflected in the budget. We cannot expect our communities to come out without getting funding. And I look forward to hearing from the, the administration, uh, represented by the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, on the plan on how we get there through the questions that we're gonna be asking. And so before I move forward, I just wanna uh, also let you know that uh, our Bronx colleague, Mark Jonai, Council Member Mark Jonai is here today as well. And I wanna say thank you to our final uh, our financial analyst, Jin Lee. Uh, she is the unit head, oh sorry, so she's, she's part of the finance unit and she'll be leaving us, uh, she, this is her last day. So we're really thankful. Uh, she's done a lot with her team to prepare for today. And so I wanna say thank you for your service. Uh, a lot of what you're gonna see today has been prepared by her and we couldn't be the strong committee that we are, especially in this budget hearing, without her. Thank you, Jen. Uh, unit head, Krillian Francisco. Our committee counsel, Harbani Auja. Policy analyst, Elizabeth Kronk. Community liaison, Stella Chan and my Chief of Staff, Sociata Meng, and my Communications Director, Tony Chirito. We are fueled by an incredible, incredible team here at the City Council for this committee. So with that, I want to ask the Commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, Ms. Uh, Vita Mostofi, to come up, and her team, whoever will be with her team. And so we're gonna, uh, I had a quick conversation before the meeting, the hearing started, uh, and I understand you have written testimony. And so I just wanna let you know, we have the testimony, super thankful for that. We're gonna be working uh, diligently to come through it. But because there are no new needs that you're presenting to the council, and we have received the annual report, I'm gonna ask that we go right into questions uh, with an opportunity for you to have a, a, a quick statement uh, to introduce yourself and to the world that's listening. And then we have a few, some questions, but I also understand you have to leave a little early, so I wanna make sure that we get you out on time. Thank you for, for your cooperation, and we look forward to talking. Good afternoon, um, and happy Nowruz or Persian New Year. Today marks the day, so happy to join with all of you in celebrating. Um, and thank you to uh, Chairman Chaka and members of the Committee on Immigration. As the chair noted, 
I have submit, submitted written testimony. We've also published this really incredible annual report that speaks to Immigrant New York and the work of the office over the past year. Um, we have extra copies for folks who are interested that we can share, um, and it's also available online. Um, I think you rightly note that this has been a difficult time for our communities with countless and endless attacks um, from everything from public charge proposal to the end and termination of TPS and DACA. Uh, both the city as well as providers throughout our city have taken leadership roles in really stepping up and being responsive to this context. Um, before we go into questions, the additional note I would say is we've done this in parallel to ensuring that we have simultaneously been moving towards the full realization of a vision of a city where all immigrants can thrive regardless of their status or English proficiency. So we're happy to talk specifically about some of that work uh, in the Q&A, but we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner, and uh, we want to swear you in as we, as we enter the Q&A process. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with some opening questions. And I guess the, the, the real conundrum here for us is, is the, the report really highlighted a lot of the the work that has happened in the city. And what I saw most telling across the, the charts were the, the connection to status and the need that connects to status for our undocumented neighbors. And the need was highest always with our undocumented brothers and sisters that live in the city. And so were there any new needs that you saw as commissioner that you presented to the office of management and budget, OMB, but do not receive as an affirmation, if you will, in the preliminary budget that led us to no needs, no new needs, as the final mayor's presentation to us uh, a month and, month and so ago. Sure, so for point of clarification, I would say a couple of things um, that may have gone missed. So we did throughout the last year, as the council knows, and you held a hearing on this, do incredible amounts of work in the implementation of Local Law 30 and increasing and broadening the language access work of the city. That's so critical, particularly for undocumented populations who have greater rates of limited English proficiency. Um, and um, in assessing sort of the, the ability to increase services uh, around interpretation and translation, um, working with our agency partners, additional support was allocated to, to, con to provide increased services and coordination in local Law 30 implementation, um, namely in the shape of, a, of um, additional staff to support it. Um, additionally, we are happy to say that um, the city has, uh, or rather we've in partnership with the Office of Civil Justice have been supporting our domestic violence um, uh, work in providing immigration legal services to folks who come in through the Family Justice Centers at about $500,000. That money got baselined this year. Um, so there's an additional $500,000 that we will be moving towards allocating <coughs> towards um, immigration legal support. And these are all shifts within the budget, right? So you're, you're moving money from one place to another, or this is this is new money. New money. That and how did that? How did that? Uh, so I get where it landed for the for the work for local law thirty. Yeah. Uh, where did that money come from? So so I, I'm kind of, I, what I heard you say was as part of the the kind of um, work to comply with local law thirty, <coughs> especially for limited uh, English proficiency New Yorkers, that that you announced new money for. But there was additional staff to help coordinate services of increased translation right. and interpretation, working with agency partners at DCAS to implement those where our contracts are. And what, what, what date was that? When did that happen? Um, uh, when the budget was introduced. <laughs> Got it. So you're saying, okay, I heard, I heard, thank you for clarifying. So you, I heard that 
this is this is already kind of been implemented. You're saying that as part of as part of the preliminary budget, this already included this, this work that you just. This is a new allocation. This is a new allocation. A request. Yes. Got it. Thank you. Um, okay. So. And obviously highlighting need for increased immigration legal services. One of the ways that that was addressed was looking at baselining 500,000 that we'd previously allocated, as I said, through our family justice centers for support for immigrants okay. who receive legal services. And that's a baseline. And that's, and that's baseline new baseline money. money. Okay, yes. got it. Thank you, those are two, two notes to have. And the mayor made it very clear from, from the first minute of his presentation on the budget that there was gonna be pegs. Uh, can you describe a little bit how you understand pegs to be from your perspective? And you being uh, within the mayor's office, your budget, as we've learned over the years, is connected to other agencies. And so how are you thinking about those cuts as, as commissioner within the mayor's office and your relationship to the other agencies? What, how's that, how does that work? How do you negotiate that? Um, I think as you know, agencies um, were given or allocated portions of the PEGs um, and agencies are in the process of working with OMB to identify um, uh, where they will happen. So we will stay in close contact with agencies and OMB as that process is undertaken. Um, but nothing was, was specifically allocated to, to us. So, so so nothing has been allocated for Moya, the mayor's office of immigrant affairs. Okay, and then we're, we're talking about an additional savings of about seven hundred and fifty million dollars that he's asking agencies and across the board to cut. This is this is pretty big. This is a, and so more than the intention that I just heard. What what work have you done so far to understand those cuts? How are you protecting the work that that we highlighted? that we've been highlighting together in the work that we've done. So tell me, get us a, a little bit more sense on that because we don't know yet across the board from all, this is the kind of notes that are coming back from all the budget hearings that anybody has a sense about any cuts whatsoever and we're already at the end of our preliminary budget process before the executive. That's, that's pretty scary. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I, I'll have to reiterate what I, what I noted, which is that we're in close conversations with agencies as they're going through this decision And what are those conversations? Tell us a little bit about what those conversations are. Um, obviously, we want to ensure that the, the level of service that we're providing, um, we're able to continue to provide, that we're also able to continue to look at the needs and be flexible in addressing those needs as we see them. Um, that's been the message we've communicated with OMB as well um, across programs that we help oversee as well as key initiatives. So we'll continue to do that work, um, but uh, there, have, there hasn't been, I should say, um, uh, final decision making <laughs> um, on this front, so it's difficult to, to give you more without hypothesizing. What agencies are you, are you in communication with right now? Um, primarily with DSS. DSS. Yes. Okay. Uh, so nothing. That's really the probably the, the most funding is held under DSS, yeah. which I understand is HRA, but it's DSS. It's both. Both. Okay. <laughs> HRA was under the umbrella umbrella of yes, DSS. Yes. Remember the chart. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm trying to visualize <laughs> it now. So I'm I'm trying to share my learning, <laughs> my 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 learning here. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on there because it's, it sounds like this is the, the, just the typical st stuff that's happening right now. Everyone's still in negotiations, and we don't know that yet either what the cuts are going to be. And I really do hope that you fight for every dollar that goes out to immigrant communities. Okay, so what are your goals then and priorities for the immigrant communities and for fiscal year 2020? And anything that you see as really at the top of the priority list? Sure. I mean, I think, um, as we've previously noted, for us it's really important to continue to monitor what we're seeing in terms of the federal shifts and how they're impacting um, our communities. Um, one of the um, obviously key areas, and you see this in the discrepancy in the annual report of, on service delivery, is in the area of health um, and increased concerns 
So a big focus of ours in the coming year, we're very happy to say, is working closely with h and &H in the implementation of NYC CARE. We've already begun that partnership. Um, Amoya is helping to advise on um, the program as well as to lead on the outreach pieces of it. Um, and so that will continue to be a huge area of focus for us in making sure that we're, we're chipping away at those disparities on health access for immigrant New Yorkers. Um, similarly, we'll continue to monitor, um, as I noted, what's happening in the um, uh, landscape around re legal representation. We were very happy to now have this additional half a million allocation. We're continuing to look at what other needs are how that can uh, uh, help flood um, and address some of the gaps, but we're in ongoing conversations with providers and community service organizations to make sure that we're not missing anything. So these are kind of topical areas of focus for you as you move forward and... Sorry, I would add one more thing yeah, before please. we go on, which is a huge piece of what we've been doing and building on in partnership with you all and others is just increasing the level of education and information for communities. This is a oh. confusing period. It results in people being caught up in increased fraudulent activity. And one of the things right. also that you see in our report is the disparity in um, uh, economic um, uh, income and, and stability for New Yorkers. And so we want to make sure that we're helping through pervasive engagement, education, uh, campaigns, getting information out. We're preventing people from losing uh, important money um, through uh, some of the fraudulent activity um, that is undertaken and the, the predatory and, and vulnerable kind of populations falling victim to that. Thank you for outlining that. And I think that we're, we're gonna wanna stay close on those items as we move forward, thank you. Um, we, we, have a sh we have a short time with the commissioner, so I wanna give opportunities for the council members. Uh, we're gonna put up a, a clock, if I can get the Sergeant of Arms to do a clock for the, for the questions. Uh, let's do as many rounds as we need to, um, but let's keep our questions focused. We are also joined by council member Drum and council member finance chair Drum and council member from Queens, Holden. Okay, first question up is council member Jonah. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's not enough time to ask all the questions that need to be asked, but in particular, I need to hear from you about the peg cuts. You have not been approached as to what dollar amount should be cut from your budget. I'd like to hear more. Have you had conversations, if you have, with whom and when? Uh, it's a little disturbing to me that a budget for this particular cause, which is less than 1% of the overall budget, is being cut. I believe it's 1% of the overall budget that uh, we're referring to here. And at a time when we're increasing our budget by over $3 billion, why there's any cuts going to immigrants is beyond comprehension. More disturbing is the $4.3 million that's being allocated for Census 2020. That amounts to about 50 cents per New York City resident aside from being able to send out one piece of mail, how are we gonna reach our most vulnerable communities, non-English speaking, um, what's the outreach plan, knowing that we have so much to lose that if we don't account for every single resident, and in this report it doesn't mention, or there's no reference to the federal government announcing uh, the question of whether or not you are a citizen or not, I don't see a response as to what this administration is going to do about the census question uh, as we move forward. Um, this is truly a difficult and challenging time for all New Yorkers, but it's never been more challenging than for our immigrant population. Does that answer? Yeah, thank you. Stop uh the clock. <laughs> Save my time for later. Um, thank you, Council Member, for the questions. So again, on the PEG, um, we have not received a, a particular uh, cut. 
However, many of the programs that we help oversee and the, the initiatives of the city that serve immigrant uh, New Yorkers live at other agencies that have received overarching cuts. So we are in close conversation with those agencies um, to help ensure that we don't see um, impacts on services that we're providing immigrant New Yorkers, that we are uh, ensuring that we are able to continue to do the work that we're doing and that we're not, um, you know, we're not taking unnecessary risks in ensuring that the, that the del delivery of those services are accomplished. So that's ongoing conversations that agencies are having about uh, those cuts with OMB. I have, have reiterated um, my own concerns um, across both agencies and with OMB on this and we'll remain in contact and I'm sure update the council as uh, decisions are made about where cuts will, will take place. By the way, the only place I see an increase here um, is in Moya, uh, which is disturbing because that just means same head count, but people are getting raises and we're cutting vital programs. Um, I'm not sure what that's in reference to, but I'm happy to connect and make sure I understand what you're seeing. And There's a $49,000 increase in Moya's budget line item which is only one of several that have been cut. And the detail reveals the same headcount, but yet there's an increase in PS. So I don't know what that's referring to. It might be the, the increased language um, access coordination work, but without seeing it, I can't specifically be responsive to it. But as I noted to the council member, um, the we, we did discuss the need for incre increased language services to make sure that we're effectively implementing local law 30, um, and that was granted. And that's maybe where it, That uh, might be it, but okay. I can't speak specifically. Right. Okay. And as the point I'm making is that we're cutting across the board, but yet the only place I see an increase is in salaries due to the mayor's head count and who he gets to appoint, and we've grown our head count to a high of 330,000 people employed by New York City while we cut services and to whom the most vulnerable immigrants. Um, I would just say that really the, the goal is to increase services and access with this support. So the way that the interpretation and translation services work is that you are able to effectively leverage and move that work by having somebody that's receiving the requests um, and able to process and move them. So we, we do see this as an increase in access and service for New Yorkers by increasing interpretation and translation services across programs and outreach. Um, on your question around census, um, I would uh, note a couple of things. One, the city's been uh, directly involved with the litigation to ensure that the inclusion of a citizenship question is not uh, does not happen. Um, we are committed to continuing to do that fight. There is an uh, oral argument at the Supreme Court in April, um, and we look forward to uh, what we all hope is a just uh, affirmation of what the lower court noted, which is that the inclusion of that question should not continue. Um, and as to uh, sort of increase uh, need for outreach and engagement. I think it's very important um, as we're doing to continue to speak to community members and others to ensure that um, we are responsive to the needs. Um, as the council member knows, I'm happy to have joined uh, the state's complete count commission. Part of my role on that commission is to inform uh, the state budget process and make recommendations as to budget needs to ensure that there is a complete count. Um, there should be a hefty responsibility on the state uh, in ensuring that there is money allocated towards community-based organizations and others to be able to do this outreach. So we look forward to, to uh, advocating in that process as well. The proposed budget shows only $4.3 million allocated to the census, which breaks down to 50 cents per resident. I couldn't run a campaign on that dollar amount, let alone how do I reach the 8.6 million residents to make sure that they register, that they understand the importance of the census, let alone the difficulties of reaching out to the immigrant 
population, those that are undocumented, and explaining to them that they should not be fearful of the census, and this is actually going to help them more than uh, hurt them. This dollar amount couldn't get out more than a mailer, let alone allow for any real follow-through or follow-up. That's the point that I'm making. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jonah. And I'm going to be cognizant of time because I know we don't have you here for a long, a long time, Commissioner. Um, but that is a that is a grave um, situation we're in right now, and and I stand by those words that were just said. Uh, next questions are coming from Councilmember Holden. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here. I, I have a couple of questions. I know, I know we're on the clock, so. I'll have to uh, do it quickly. Um, I really, I recently met with ICE uh, director, uh, and uh, they they were throwing out different numbers than you, you're you're doing. Um, rough, they re they said uh, that roughly 90% of ICE deportations were for undocumented aliens who were either charged with a crime or had prior convictions. Now, out of nearly 50 million dollars going into legal services, how much money of this, this money, is appropriated for saving criminals from deportation? Um, so I'll say a few things here. Um, the first is to say that uh, as our recently released fact sheet indicates, and we're happy to share this with others, um, our team did do an analysis of what ICE arrests and removals have been and looked like. Um, I think it's important to note here that ICE has dramatically increased arrests across the city, over 80 per the city and the metropolitan area that it covers, um, over 80 percent um, since the end of the Obama administration. I want to note that of that increase, there's been an over 400 percent increase in individuals who actually don't have a criminal conviction. Um, so I think it's really important to uh, ensure that the message that ICE is sharing is uh, actually um, further explained <laughs> with their own data. Um, and we underscore the fact that there are so many families across the city who have not yet fully gone through um, their process, who are very vulnerable at this moment in time, um, and whom with a overbroad enforcement operation that ICE is conducting are at risk of deportation. Um, we have as a city proudly struck a balance that we believe in, allows us to ensure that we're advancing public safety while maintaining the trust uh, and confidence of our community members. Uh, and we live in a moment in time where we have the most immigrants we've ever had in a century in our city and we're the safest big city in America. So we're clearly doing something right on that path. Um, I would say in terms of the allocation of uh, uh, resources, um, the city does not ask uh, for a breakdown of um, somebody's history. Uh, the city has noted that where somebody has been, the mayor has noted that where somebody has been convicted of one of the 170 offenses on our detainer list, um, city allocated full representation funds would not go to that representation. So is there any, so if, if somebody's commit multiple felonies and um, you, and, or they commit a, let's say a felony, you'll actually represent them uh, in, in the courts? So I'll repeat that the city, the administration, and the city council have determined that there are a number of violent and serious felonies in which we believe somebody might be a public safety risk. It is in those instances that the mayor's policy indicates that city allocated represent, full representation for cases should not be afforded. Um, however, we don't otherwise ask providers to indicate to us um, the histories of their clients. All right, because there have been some cases where, um, for instance, Charles Cooper, he was a Liberian war criminal, was recently, uh, uh, and, and again, they, they were convicted, at least uh, charged for war crimes, uh, and uh, Cooper was part of a regime that killed women and children in vicious ways. He was arrested in 2017, uh, and the NYPD and Sanctuary Cities policy ended with ICE detainer being disregarded. Luckily, ICE did get him, and, and uh, he was in for a deportation. But there, there's some, uh, again, I'm getting ICE's 
part of it. I don't know, have you met with ICE to, uh, to really go over this? Because they're, they disputed everything that you're putting out. So I, I think there's another side that maybe we can get ICE here. Uh, they haven't been invited, but I think we might want to hear another side because we're protecting the public, obviously, from there's criminals in, in, involved here. And I don't, I'm not really sure uh, that we shouldn't be cooperating to an extent when the criminals are involved. And in fact, I believe that we should cooperate, um, especially for individuals like Charles Cooper, who get out, or the individual that was arrested multiple times for the murder on the number seven line uh, and uh, shooting the, the victim five times as part of a gang member. So uh, gangs, that we're getting into the uh, into. By the way, um, Nassau County and uh, uh, Nassau County Police and Suffolk Police are cooperating with ICE, and they've seen a dramatic um, decrease in gang-related activities and murders, uh, while New York City is starting to see an increase. So that, I'm just concerned that the, the the felons, the real you know the career criminals, um, are be that's being addressed by uh, this administration. Um, I, would, I would simply note a few things. One is to say that public safety is clearly a primary concern and interest of the administration. Um, and uh, everything that we've done has been to ensure that we are effectively doing what advances that interest. That includes ensuring that our immigrant populations feel confident and trusted, reporting crimes to us, um, that they feel confident uh, serving as witnesses to crimes, that they feel they're, they are able to advocate on behalf of themselves and seek out their rights. Um, you have a very complicated immigration system, and I think the city has struck the right balance, as is evidenced by our decline in criminal activity in the city, and as I noted, the robust and incredible immigration community that we have. I'm happy to talk further with you. We do maintain a line of communication with ICE. Um, that is certainly an uh, appropriate and necessary thing to ensure that there is an open line of communication. I can't speak to the specifics of the cases that, you're noted, that you have noted. However, I would point back to the fact that uh, we feel confident in our policies because they are af actually working in what we're seeing transpire in our city. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Councilmember Holden, for your questions. Um, we will continue with questions. Uh, next on the line is Councilmember Drum. And we were also joined by Councilmember Matthew Eugene. Thank you. Just a little bit um, in regard to uh, what Councilmember Holden was asking as well. Um, I believe that under the Obama administration, um, there was some uh, discretionary enforcement of um, what it meant to, me to have committed a crime and whether or not it was a real threat or danger to um, the community. Have, do you know if there's been any uptick in just overall? I mean, are, are these 90% that um, uh, they're saying uh, have a criminal record, are those criminal records for misdemeanors, for jumping the turnstile, or are they serious felonies? Yeah, thank you for the question. So that's accurate to say that um, there was previously a um, memorandum that laid out discretion that the administration was abiding by, and that discretion was really to hone in on where public safety risks exist uh, and to ensure that what you weren't seeing were um, individuals who uh, had low-level offenses or otherwise um, may have just simply been undocumented, who have family ties and other interests in the United States. Um, you weren't seeing a, a, a sort of breakage of that family for long-term individuals that really don't pose a, a serious public safety risk. Um, I think, as I noted, um, the uh, overbroad um, and sort of uh, complete, they, they've completely put that uh, prosecutorial discretion aside. Um, they now have a very overbroad agenda. Um, they do not look for, at people who have had convictions, actually. Um, as I noted, an over 400% increase in people who have not actually been yet convicted of a crime at all or an offense at all, um, and in terms of the range of convictions in which they um, are uh, seeking to, to potentially deport people, as you noted, it's, it's not just people who have committed violent or serious offenses who pose real public safety risks. I just wonder if they're batching them all in there together. You know, I also did have the opportunity when I was chair of the Immigration Committee um, to meet with ICE 
particularly around the issue of getting ice trailers off of Rikers Island. And I remember that they basically laughed at us and they would not come to a public hearing but they did meet with us, uh, with the speaker at the time, uh, to discuss that issue. And they told us that we could not remove ice trailers and the issue of um, um, jurisdiction, I guess, was one. Obviously, they were wrong and we were right. Yeah. And uh, the ice trailers have been removed from, um, from Rikers. So I find that oftentimes, even when we have discussions with ice, that they're not 100% uh, truthful in their answers. That's just been my, my, um, my observation with them. I would affirm that by noting, of course, that uh, recent uh, uh, federal court and other cases have affirmed that municipalities actually don't have the authority to hold people past their release dates. And in fact, where a certain cooperation um, resulted in uh, that happening, that now, including on Long Island, uh, districts and areas are prohibited from holding people past uh, their release dates and times under the Constitution. So um, I think you're accurate to say that, and in fact, the courts have affirmed that. New York State court decision, I'm being <laughs> told to affirm. Well, I was gonna ask some things about um, uh, the action New York City plan. Yeah. You currently partner with CBOs and health and hospitals and locations and schools and places like that. Do you have plans to expand this to other sites around um, you know, other than those, um, than those, than those locations? Yes, um, hopefully. We are in the process of looking at uh, potential expansion to libraries. Um, we currently operate our New York citizenship program in libraries. We have a lot of learnings and continued learnings to, to undertake to understand the need of immigrant New Yorkers as they're coming through the libraries. Um, but this is something that we are looking at um, and interested in doing. Are you working with TPS recipients also um, in light of some of the recent decisions that have happened around that issue? Yes, so part of what we've undertaken through our outreach and community engagement work is just ensuring that TPS recipients know how to access uh, legal support through Action NYC. Council member Eugene has been a great partner um, in the uh, administration of clinics. Um, specifically in your area, thank you for your work on this issue. Um, we have um, uh, adjusted, if you will, and kind of finer tuned our hotline um, so that as people call, the hotline is able to see sort of the urgency of a case and make sure if you need a DACA renewal or your TPS might be ending, that you're prioritized and can see somebody immediately. Also in light of a recent court decision regarding special immigrant juvenile status, the first piece of legislation that I passed in the council was in regard to that and the relationship that ACS has with juveniles in their custody. Have you had an opportunity to discuss with them the implications or the ramifications for the court decision, although it was in our favor? Yeah. Were they holding off? What were they doing? Or what is your, your view on what's going on there now? Yeah, as you know, this is a very recent decision just this um, week, but one that needs great celebration and gratitude towards the legal service providers that brought it. Um, unjustly, of course, the Trump administration was trying to limit um, uh, special immigrant juvenile status uh, for older children who are here. Um, I would say that we, uh, as you, you know, in this past um, year, we allocated over $4 million towards the representation of unaccompanied ch children, so increasing uh, the ability to represent these very kids. Um, and we are in conversations to ensure that as um, I believe the court has indicated it will, it is asked to sort of look at cases that had been denied um, and to, to revisit or re-adjudicate those. So we'll maintain conversations with providers to make sure that they have what they need to be able to take these cases. And finally, if I may just, oh, just one last my, question. My, my last question, just on um, Action New York City. Um, how are you doing with, I know you had said in the last report that you were gonna do more outreach to Asian uh, speaking um, immigrants. How is that going? Yeah, thank you for the question. So we've just in this last year increased pr um, provider services across a number of Asian serving CBOs. 
Um, and as a result of that, we've actually seen an increase of about 67% in the number of cases um, uh, of individuals across uh, these communities. Thank you, uh, Chair Drum. And our next in line is Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, my colleague uh, to the mainland, I told him I was going to ask this, uh, but he had to run to another event, uh, another meeting, um, asked about the $49,000 increase to the Moya budget. Um, and uh, his questions were around whether or not we think we're doing enough. And obviously, we can always do more. But I just wanted to be clear and to have you discuss this on the record. At 40, the, the, the Moya budget is not the full breadth of the services that are provided to the immigrant populations of New York. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, because an enormous amount of funding flows to other agencies, and it's from those agencies that the services are actually provided, whereas your office functions as the coordinating body, if you will, of those services. Is that yeah, a yes. fair statement? Yes, and okay. thank you for that. So the $49,000 uh, that is being increased, while not that great, and obviously every penny is important, um, is not necessarily a deprivation, if you will, of the services and the commitment that this administration has to the immigrant populations in New York City. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Can we talk a, um, for a moment about um, the uh, translating services that your office has fought very hard and a valiant battle uh, to bring to uh, the uh, polls and the voters of New York City and recognizing, of course, uh, that uh, you had uh, elections thrown upon you that were not anticipated and that I would love to have not had, um, but notwithstanding, we had them. Can you discuss that a little bit? Of course. Okay. Um, you, uh, you, you coordinated this effort to bring translators above and beyond what was being provided uh, by the Board of Elections. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you spent in some money on that? In partnership with other in agents. In partnership with, yes. yes. Well, you spent money on that um, uh, because A, it was not being provided by the Board of Elections, and B, obviously, the city and the administration has a commitment to trying to increase uh, the number of people who have fair access to our polls. That's right. Okay. How much do you know, if, if you know, how much uh, additional was spent on the uh, translating services above and beyond what had been anticipated? Um, so, I, I'm not sure I fully grasped the question, but I can say that we, al we allocated about $640,000 this fiscal year towards this um, initiative. Um, we have not overspent on that yet, so that is, um, we are within that budget. Um, and you're correct to note that there are unanticipated elections and we're currently in the process of assessing uh, how best um, to ensure that we're, we're continuing to do this work um, and what might be needed to do so. It's like whack-a-mole. Every time I try to stop a special election, another one pops up. Um, <laughs> but uh, notwithstanding, the, 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 uh, your office's commitment is to continue that program and to grow it so that, because uh, obviously we did a couple of sites, not as many as we would love to do, but you know our limitations are what they are, but you intend to continue growing that to try to bring translating services to wherever they're needed across the city, is that correct? Yeah, and to be clear, that this is what the voters have asked for as well, as, you, as many of you might know in the general election and the charter revision questions, the second question actually specifically uh, noted that there the the, um, the new uh, uh, civic, civic engagement, engagement thank you commission would actually incorporate this work as a part of its mandatory tasks um, and initiatives uh, and the voters overwhelmingly supported um, that decision so that would take effect in 2020 and of course when that happens you'll see the con the continued commitment that the administration has in ensuring that we're acting on the voters' wishes um, in continuing to do that work. And, and until then, um, the, our, my office and other city agencies will continue to uh, increase language services at elections. Yeah, Mr. Chairman uh, nodded to me that I get one more quick question. And you read my mind because I wanted to ask you about how your office falls into the new Civic Engagement Commission. Um, and I know that hasn't uh, actually been created yet, although the voters 
created it, but it is you know, a time period by when it's supposed to be created. I know the mayor's uh, out there uh, looking for people to appoint to the commission, and I know that's part of it. Do you anticipate offloading some of your work into the Civic Engagement Commission or to folding Moya into it, or how, how would that work? Um, so what we had proposed, and again, the voters um, affirmed, would be that as we do across the administration, and as I think you rightly articulated, serving as a coordinated kind of expert on services to immigrant communities, we anticipate continuing to do. On this initiative, the commission is required to consult with our office on looking at um, what languages and communities um, we should be serving um, and how best to do that. So we will continue to maintain that role um, and ensure that we're um, smartly, effectively looking at the immigrant communities, how they're changing, what the needs are, and that we're using that data and information to uh, make decisions about where we're providing these services. Thank you very much for your work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Yeager. And we have been joined by Councilmember Miller as well. And Councilmember Eugene has a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is very, a very quick question, only one. I've been looking to the draft, this one. And I see that they say that TPS recipient in New York City. And uh, I see 15,000. Is it correct? That, because only for the Haitian people, we have about 60,000 Haitian on TPS. So I'm not sure what, I you're, don't know what, is, uh, what you're looking at. But um, our, my office did produce a um, fact sheet on TPS recipients. Um, in the city, we tried to isolate not, so not, you might be looking at also statewide numbers. We tried to isolate the oh, number okay. of individuals within the city specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and while the state has more TPS recipients, yeah. the city, the five boroughs, we estimate to have about 15,000. Right. The largest much. number of those recipients are um, Haitians. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Now, uh, it's 3 o'clock. I'm going to ask a few more questions. Yep. Um, but I'm going to let you tell us when you have to leave. So you tell me. OK. Um, my, my, my next question is really about the adult literacy initiative that we've been fighting and championing for a while now. Uh, I think everyone probably knows about the adult literacy love that we have here and the partnership that we hold with you and everyone else. Of the $12 million that you we, we allocated as a team last year, do you need additional funding in 20 for, uh, from the adult literacy funding source? If so, how much? And did you submit these new needs for FY20 to OMB yet? And I think you know what I'm talking about here. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Sure. Um, so I think that you're aware, but we've been lucky to be working with our um, partners at uh, the Mayor's Office for Workforce Development, um, who are sharing in the leadership on this issue with us, um, really hoping, uh, I think in response to, to requests from you and from this committee and from advocates, to ensure that the city is sort of systematically looking at this work broadly, making sure that we have somebody that's committed to really um, identifying the needs and thinking about how best to address them. Um, we have been in conversations with them about the um, specific needs around uh, literacy and ensuring that we're, we're addressing um, some of the gaps there. Um, and we've included in those conversations um, uh, the We Speak program and making sure that we see that as a supplement to classes and that we are continuing to infuse in um, uh, the field, the ability to rely on more curriculum, professional development, and other resources that the program seeks to offer. And how much are you going to be requesting to pull out of the adult literacy funding to do this? Um, we have not requested to pull anything out of the funding to do that. Got it. Okay. Are, so are we going to see another... Um, thank you for sharing that. I think that's that's kind of a broader context of the work we're doing on adult literacy and workforce yep. development. Super helpful, and and really what what. And now I guess this is the this is the moment where I, I kind of reiterate my my yearly commitment 
to adult literacy classes and making sure that we have classes. And then every year, portion of that goes to other things that are not classes. And part of that is Moya work. And so I don't want to be surprised again uh, from this. This is an opportunity for you to talk to us about that. Um, sure. And if there's going to be anything that we're, we should expect as we move through the, those negotiations, so it's not a surprise later. And what I want to say now is that we're going to fight for that 12 million again to re uh, with a baseline and higher and higher rates for contracts and teachers and paying our teachers what they deserve. Uh, you can comment on that if you'd like to, but um, every year there, a portion of that goes to other non-classroom instruction for adult literacy work, and some of that is to Moya. Sure. So. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that if that's okay. So I, I guess a couple of things. One, I think as you're also aware, we uh, last year allocated funding to CUNY to do an evaluation for us uh, around adult literacy broadly um, and to make sure that we're understanding sort of what the needs are and where um, they exist and how best to look at um, uh, addressing them. Um, as you're aware, the DYCD holds the contracts, um, and some of the challenges have been not because um, there wasn't a, an interest in doing it, but because there was a challenge in um, uh, increasing amounts outside of the RFP process and ensuring that we could, could do so effectively. Our hope is to get this evaluation to best understand it. DYCD will be going, as I understand it, into an RFP process this coming year, um, and so hopefully some of, I think, the, the things that you've expressed get addressed because we're at the right kind of juncture to be able to do so. Um, in terms of the um, kind of use or uh, the um, kind of other ways that we've tried to uh, address the needs in this moment in time, in this juncture, um, I would just kind of put an asterisk on the fact that a lot of what we've sought to develop has been uh, looking at how to ensure the field actually has more resources. So even if they're not going directly to the classroom setting for reasons like this, we've worked closely with, um, with CUNY experts who are some of the leaders really on adult literacy in developing ESOL curricula using the second season of We Speak. Um, so that, that those materials are available to the field um, to put those online. So I would just want to ensure that there's awareness that the, the resources are going to the field um, and we have a shared interest in ensuring that uh, there's also increased uh, classroom opportunities. Thank you for that. I, I think. Um, we're gonna hear from the advocates on this too, so I, th I think we're gonna get a, a fresh perspective. Sure. And I think you're right. Everything is moving towards fixing the system that yep. we continue to rely on and don't give it the resources that we need to ensure that the adult literacy education uh, uh, work that we're doing in our neighborhoods gets fully funded. And, and so let's, let's, let's work together on that. Um, let's talk about IDNYC, and we've had some hearings in the past few months about IDNYC and how um, you're preparing for the next version. And I think what's important here as we focus on the budget is where, where do we see in the budget <coughs> the added resources necessary for the vision that, I, that we all kind of been learning about in terms of IDNYC 2.0? Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's official but what I'm gonna call IDNYC 2.0. And we just, again, this is part of this conundrum of no new need, and yet we're, we're being visionary about yep. the concept of IDNYC 2.0. Sure, so um, I think a couple of things to say there. As you're aware, we are in an exploratory process. We're trying to understand what's possible um, both in terms of the increase in technology that it would allow us to integrate um, with city agencies and services and access that New Yorkers have with IDNYC, as well as the possibility of connecting um, that technology with a banking partner. Um, we are still in that exploratory process. We're continuing those conversations. As you know, we're hearing from advocates from you and others 
um, and engaging with a number of experts to make sure we have done our due diligence before making a determination on this. So um, while that has un is undertaken, we don't have a, a budget um, request for it until we make the decision. Um, and then, of course, we were greenlit to do the exploration, so there is an understanding that there might be budget costs, but we also don't know that until we actually see uh, kind of where we land. So does this mean that we lose the opportunity to do anything for IDNYC 2.0 if we don't land it in this budget? We'll have to wait till the next fiscal year to uh, outlay whatever, whatever final decision is made is made? Um, I think we'll have to, uh, you know, we'll have to make that determination when we have a recommendation. So um, as folks are aware, we're, we're not, we haven't rushed the process. Um, we definitely have an interest in making sure that when we um, begin our renewal period, we're making sure that New Yorkers um, have access to new ways in using their, their card. Um, but we won't rush that decision in, uh, in a way that jeopardizes the process and the due diligence. So um, I think, again, it's, a, it's a ensuring that we're, we're on the right timeline, but at the same time making sure we're, we're being smart about the decisions and when we're making them. I don't think that that means um, we would have to wait a whole other year for the budget process. I would hope not, but that because we were uh, given the ability to do the exploration, there's an understanding that a recommendation might come sooner. Well, the only thing I want to say here is, is this is this is almost like how not to do a budget, right? I think part of what we um, are seeing in some other pockets when we think about, because I want to move over to legal representation next. Um, I'm thinking about adult literacy and how we've done li adult literacy. It's, it's, it's felt uncomfortable at times because we essentially put the money in and then we spend it later within the, but the, within the fiscal year. And that's, that's been tricky. That's been uncomfortable. We're making decisions and some of those are delayed. And in this case, we have a situation where we don't know the, we don't know the budget. You're doing the due diligence about understanding. And if we don't put the money in, we're going to have to find it somewhere. And so then, then, then we lose the power of a transparent process, which is what this is. And so then, then it just happens. And that makes a lot of New Yorkers uncomfortable. And so that, that's what I don't want to do. And so in some ways, the best way to budget is in a transparent way so we can talk about it and understand it once there's a proposal and you have a good sense. And that's the work that we have to do openly. And, and that th doesn't seem like that's something that I'm hearing from you right now. And so if you can help just clarify that and understand our intentions here so sure. that we can, we can work together to land whatever that might be, especially if we're moving into an executive budget, we have no idea what's gonna happen there and we're gonna get into the throes of negotiations after the executive budget hearings, which I'm hoping we have another one of because I think there's a lot of questions we're leaving on the table here. That we, that we really examine that and have an open, transparent process about all of these pieces, especially at DMYC. Um, so I would just say, as with all things with the program, we've been very transparent about what we're doing and our intention, we'll continue to do that. Okay, and, and then again, what I'm saying is, if we have to find the money after the fiscal budget has been presented and adopted, and we have to summon the dollars, to pay for the vision that we all agree on, we, we escape the transparent process of the budget hearings. And that's a different process. And that makes me feel uncomfortable. That's all I'm saying. I understand. I think, okay, I think there's a, you know, trying to not put a, what's the right adage, a, a square peg in a round hole situation, right? Cart before horse kind yeah. of thing. Which is unfortunate, but where we're at. Okay, let's go on to legal representation. Um, Varick Street and the work that we're doing around Varick Street to understand what's happening there. Uh, Varick Street is opening two new courtrooms and the press has been really good at really announcing the work that's happening there to, well, what, what, with what I think both of us would agree on are malintentions mm -hmm. for the community that we're trying to support Two new courtrooms to hear detained cases, but knife up providers, caseloads will increase. 
by two thirds as a result. And so the providers currently do not have the staff to keep up with their increases or anticipating a lot more need. Um, and so how are, how are you following that? Are you working with the civil uh, justice office, securing emergency funding for this work? How are, you, how are you taking this on? This is a city council funded initiative, but essentially this is still a city project. And so uh, I know that you hold a lot of these cases because they come to you, they come to me. And so how are you thinking about this and how, how to solve this moment? Yeah, the- thank you for the question. And I would reiterate a few things about um, the challenges with the courts. Um, they're myriad. Um, they run across the gamut, not just in the detained docket, but in the non-detained docket, as well as in folks who are coming in for ICE supervision check-ins, as well as people who are going to administrative interviews, as well as people who are being picked up um, in raids. And so part of the challenge that we face, of course, broadly, Um, and has been the goal that we've had as a city in looking at our immigration legal services funding is funding a spectrum of need, uh, trying to look and understand where gaps are, trying to make sure that we're addressing them effectively and hearing from legal service providers um, and others in the process to make sure that that's informing the decision because they're the experts on the ground and seeing what's happening. We've had regular conversations with the Office of Civil Justice as well as Administrator Bonilla, um, legal service providers across NYFA, across community-based organizations, um, the New Sanctuary Coalition, legal legal or lawyers rather who are taking some of the habeas cases and so forth to really try and wrap our minds around where the needs really are, how are they best addressed, how can we create some efficiencies across these needs and then making some of the hard decisions about what we can do to be supportive in this space. Um, As I noted, one of the things, of course, we'll be looking at is the $500,000 allocation and what we're doing with that. Um, And we will continue to have these conversations and make sure that we're taking that into consideration. And the 500,000, that's the the local law 30 work, is that right? Is that the, that's different, okay. Um, As I noted, this was money that had been allocated to the Domestic Violence Task Force for immigration legal support. That's the one. Um, okay. They have now um, happily had that money baselined. So um, there's an additional $500,000 to go towards immigration and legal services. Got it. Thank you for that. Looking forward to talking through that with you. I think the, 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 the ultimate question comes before us as we look at the intentions of NIFUP and our partnership with IOI and an administration taking on a baseline approach to bringing re, uh, resources to lawyers to defend our New Yorkers as they are um, engaging in the courts, detained, knife up, non-detained, IOI. And now with this new court situation and the flood of more cases that are gonna get heard, we're gonna need more lawyers, right? So, and I hear, I hear that. Um, our goal for universal representation is real. Every New Yorker that's getting picked up, and you said this in, in, in many ways through the questions that were being asked, it's not, it's, not a, we're, it's not a situation where only people who have violent crimes are getting picked up. Everyone is getting picked up. And Baba, Baba um, Sila, who we were all watching last week, and all of us united around him and his family presents that conundrum of both the ICE focus and the deportation machine that's real, the judges that are now ready to take everyone and push them out as quickly as possible. And so now is the time. Are we going to commit to universal representation model? And what is the role of Moya in pushing this internally with your conversations at, Mo- at OMB, with DSS, banks, the mayor? And so are you ready to give us a sense about where you are on that? Because that is going to be a fierce council um, prerogative. Um, I think, you know, as we've said before, we, we believe as an administration that there has to be some broad um, uh, range of services that's provided in this space. Um, it is challenging to try and... Um, 
prioritize where resources are going. So beyond removal defense, we believe that there should be representation for DACA recipients. We, should, we believe there should be representation for people who are seeking to apply for relative petitions, adjustment of status, or naturalization. So as we do constantly, we are looking at where where those gaps are and how to best address them and recognize the urgency, particularly for folks who are in removal. Um, so that will be a focus um, of ours in terms of looking at how best to um, sort of assess and uh, meet those needs. So then here's a more pointed question. Where in your priority list does removal of detained and non-detained fit on your, on your stack? Where does it, where does it fit? For immigration legal services. For immigration legal services, Very at the high. top. Yes. Okay. So we're going to start there. We're going to start there because there are needs that are legal in re in relation across the entire system, but removal is the name of the game for this person in the White House, and deportation machine is real, and that's that's I think the thing that's separating our families in our in our city. Yeah. And so that I think needs to to be said here at this budget hearing. And, and for the world to know that that's something that we're talking about in a very transparent way, and we'll, we will be making the case. Um, moving on to contracting and the Mayor's Office of, of Contracts, uh, a lot of the CBOs face challenges with the city's contracting process, and this is one of those things that just keeps coming up, yep. and we're getting it from everywhere. So how does Moya help CBOs face those challenges with the city contracting process? What role can you play and what role can you tell the world, and especially the nonprofits that are here today, who are trying to do their work and get tripped up along the way with the city process that um, gets um, them off the focus of helping our immigrant communities? Yeah, I mean, so for, for areas where we have um, sort of are providing direct support and advice, particularly around immigration legal services contracting, we work very closely with our partners to try and move these as fast as possible. We recognize the challenges for our CBOs um, and you know, are committed to continuing to do the advocacy to ensure that they're, they're moving as fast as possible and that there is a recognition of why that's so important. One additional thing that I would note is um, tangential but semi-related is We've been working with the Immigration Coalition um, to develop a, um, a training and um, webinar around city procurement processes um, to ensure that, uh, you know, when sometimes the challenges that community-based organizations have is their ability to be competitive, to understand what that entails or what it means. Um, we wanna make sure that folks have good training, good information, so that they can compete, they can understand what it looks like, um, and we're hoping to be able to roll something out in the coming months with their partnership. And just give me a sense and a texture of like what that advocacy is. I, I hear the intention that you're, you're helping. What does that look like? Are you talking about like you picking up the, call, the phone, talking to the commissioner and saying, yo, what's up? This organization, <laughs> Their cash flow. Yeah, you understand the issue. Yeah, and like, is that what we're talking about, or is also there like a staff? Also, working on moving scopes of work faster. You know, defining the scope of work more quickly, particularly with um, our Action NYC providers, hoping that those that helps it move faster. So taking a more hands-on approach where we can, but also if we're hearing of issues, picking up the phone, saying what's happening. Okay, because I, I think I think we're gonna want to make sure that you hear as much as possible from them about how, how important that is. Yes. And, and there's, just so I could get a sense that you don't have a dedicated staff of, I don't like the connotation with another agency of ours, um, expediters to help expedite these contracts so that they can get their funding. The cash flow issue is real with small nonprofits. And I'm thinking, and the reason I'm asking all these questions is we're going to get to a situation where we're going to be asking for $40 million from the mayor to fund census to CBOs. And the CBOs that are speaking today at the public panel are, and this is the work that we've been doing just to get a sense about how, how healthy are they to be able to take on this $40 million injection. And if we have a problem with the contracting, this whole thing falls apart. 
And that is real. And that is, that is the mechanics and that's our responsibility, yeah. yours and mine. And so how do we do that? And, how, and so this is, this is telling me how you're doing it right now. Do you have a staff? Do you have a team? Do you have a team of expediters? Can you build that? Can you get that ready? Because census, we can't get wrong. All this money that we're talking about is, is in jeopardy. Yeah, I hear you. Um, we have folks that we work with on the Action NYC side where we have more uh, kind of direct um, uh, programmatic management over. Um, so yes, <laughs> they are focused on expediting um, those contracts. I think otherwise it's escalating, um, which is a little bit more my ballywick. <laughs> Look, we're going to do our part too, but I think unless we com come up with a system that makes it better, it's going to be a distraction. Yep. And that's not what we need right now uh, for a lot of the things that we've been talking about. One thing I would note that I left out was in the training that I described and thinking about how best to make that robust and also provide the right question and answer framework for folks, the Mayor's Office of Contracts is also supporting. Got it. And that's the procurement stuff that you're doing? So they're, they're part of it. So they're coming yes. in to support yes. that. Okay, that's, that's great. And I, th I think that's the kind of partnership you want Yes. Uh, with the expertise that's coming in. Um, let's go over to NYC Care, because that did show up in the budget, and that's, that's a more holistic, uninsured, and that's a positive thing that, that, that we saw. So is the admin using any of the lessons learned from Action Health NYC pilot? And if so, can you share what program details um, are a result of those lessons that were learned from Action Health NYC? Yeah. For sure. Um, yes, we are. <laughs> um, a lot of what we learned um, is the, the actual, the role that Moya is helping to play in looking at and advising on NYC care as a whole. So what are some of the areas of specialty care that kind of registered at the top, including mental health services, to making sure that those are specialty care that are incorporated in the broader plan that people are accessing? Um, what are ways in which we're ensuring uh, kind of robust privacy um, protections for individuals who are going to engage in um, the program? And how are we reaching folks? So what is the, how are we doing outreach um, to individuals? How are we making sure that we're equipping um, not just sort of our teams, but um, working with community-based organizations to do that work effectively? Okay, because that's, okay, so let's, let's continue that conversation as we move forward because I think that that's, that's a big chunk of change. Um, but also, I think it, it, rolling out a program like this really requires partnerships on the ground and, yes. and, and so. We agree, um, as does H&H. &H. Okay, okay, great. Um, the last, uh, Kelly, do you have any questions? We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up now. Um, I think that, that really when I think about all the, the projects before us, it, it falls on, on, on two pillars of, of trust and, and funding, which is why this budget hearing is so important. And, and, and the inspiration that I've been hearing from organizations as we've been preparing for this budget hearing has really been centered around the work that they're doing every day to save, and so many of these cases about saving families from being separated. This is the ICE uh, response, the deportation machine. Um, at the same time, n the legal case that's connected, the legal representation that's connected to this case of a family trying to stay together yeah. comes with housing issues. It comes with an eviction situation. Yeah. It comes with health. It comes with education. A family has mixed status family a child that needs to be registered UPK, but the parent is focused on their legal case. And so how do we bring a holistic approach? And it's the organizations on the ground that are doing this work that need the funding to be able to pay because asking them to do anything for free or volunteer is um, immoral. And that's not gonna happen in our city because we have the power to do that. We'd have to go to the federal government and ask for a budget bill that gets passed through this Congress, or we don't even have to go to the state and ask the governor. 
We get to do that here in our city. And that's the, the message that I want, I want you to leave with, and I understand you're gonna be meeting with the mayor very soon today. I, I hope you can take that message, that there's no way in hell that we're gonna let our CBOs go unfunded in a time where we have a $3 billion surplus this year that I know he has plans for, because the people who are being separated and impacted the most are immigrant communities, the backbone. The annual report says it well. This is what makes New York City, New York City. And if we can't do that, well, that's not an option. We're gonna do it. Yeah. And we're gonna make that happen. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much for being here today, uh, to you and your team, and I hope they can, they can stay to listen to what I'm talking about here, because it's not coming from me, it's coming from them. For sure. And uh, I can't wait to see the first panel uh, come up, and it's gonna be a whole bunch of day laborers. I don't know if you have any final thoughts you want to share with me now. I do. I have one more. I know I didn't get to read my testimony, which is fine because people will really be excited reading it later today. But I did want to share one example of um, a success story that really speaks about kind of partnerships and why that's so important to have good coordination and um, kind of show what New York City leadership looks like in this moment in time. Um, We've been seeing an increase in the need and requests that come through our constituent services um, line, which I'm sure many of you council members are as well. Um, I want to speak to one particular request that kind of highlights what I noted. So we provided crucial um, support to a U.S. citizen father, a longtime New York City resident. He had filed an immigrant visa petition for his daughter to come to the U.S. to live with him and her sister. Her sister suffered from a serious health condition, and she was a perfect bone marrow match. After she was initially denied a visa by the consulate, erroneously on a public charge ground, Moya was contacted and worked with NILAG's legal health team and others to bring the case to Senator Gillibrand's office, and I'm happy to report that the decision was reversed. She was able to secure her immigrant visa, travel to the United States to join her family, and her sister is now preparing to receive a life-saving transplant. Thank you. Thanks. That's the story of New York City right there. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you. To be continued. Yeah. We're moving on to our public panels and as, as we bring on the, uh, the, the public panels, I wanna remind everyone that if you have not yet filled out a form, please fill it out. We wanna hear from you, all of you. And the first panel we're gonna call up are a group of day laborers. And the first one from La Colmena is Erber Campa. Come on up. The Workers' Justice Project, uh, Prospero Martinez. The North, from the North Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights, uh, Silvia Flores. Oswaldo Mendoza from New York Immigrant Community Empowerment. And then, oh, that's Silvia, that's why, okay. Just the four of you? Son, cuantos son? Ah, yeah, right, we're gonna get translation, that's right. There's another seat on this side. And if we need to bring another. Muchas gracias. ¿Quién quiere empezar? La colmena. Okay, let's go for it. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Councilman. My name is Gonzalo Mercado. I'm the executive director of La Colmena, and I'm here to translate for Ever Campa, who is one of our workers that participates in the program. Hola, muy buenas tardes a todos. Eh, Gracias por estar aquí y gracias a, a, aquí al señor Carlos Menchaca por darnos la oportunidad 
Y bueno, yo estoy aquí representando aquí al, a, al centro de La Colmena y estoy aquí para dirigir este testimonio y me gustaría introducir aquí un párrafo que, que construimos y mi nombre es Ever Campa y he sido miembro de La Colmena por un año justo luego de abrir el centro de jornaleros y jornaleras Gracias aquí al señor presente, eh, Carlos Menchaca, por la oportunidad de testificar en esta importante audiencia. Good afternoon, my name is Eber Campa, uh, uh, and I've been a member of La Colmena for a year, just after the opening of the Day Labor Center. Thank you, Chairperson Menchaca, for the opportunity to testify at this important hearing. Eh, Llegué a Estados Unidos hace 10 años en busca de mejores oportunidades y seguridad para mí y mi familia. Primero trabajé en la industria de restaurante, pero lo dejé por las largas horas de trabajo y falta de transporte adecuado. Por el consejo de amigos dejé el restaurante y me paré por primera vez en una esquina de jornaleros para recibir mi primer trabajo en construcción. I arrived into the United States 10 years ago in search for better opportunities and security for myself and my family. I first worked in the restaurant industry, but I left it because of the long hours of work and lack of adequate transportation. With the advice of friends, I left the restaurant and shaped up for the first time at a day labor corner where I received my first job in construction. In ese primer trabajo, sufrí mi primer accidente laboral porque el patrón no nos dio guantes ni el equipo necesario para el trabajo y luego de un corte en mi dedo se me infectó y tuve que estar dos semanas sin trabajo y yo tuve que pagar los gastos del doctor. In that first job I suffered my first workplace accident because of the because of the employer did not give us gloves or the necessary protective equipment for the job and after a cut on my finger that got infected I had to be two weeks out of work and I had to pay for the doctor. Y hace un año conocí la colmena luego de haber sido víctima de robo de salario en el cual un patrón me quedó debiendo una semana de trabajo y pude acceder a ayuda legal para recuperar mi salario robado. También conocí de mis derechos como trabajador y luego de hacerme miembro pude recibir mi primer trabajo por medio de la colmena haciendo Chirac Compound que son mi especialidad en la construcción. A year ago, I met La Colmena after being the victim of a wage theft in which a boss didn't pay me for a week worth of work, and I was able to access legal, legal assistance to recover my stolen salary. I also learned about my rights as a worker, and after becoming a member, I was able to receive my first job through La Colmena doing sheetrock and compound that are my specialty in construction. Y hoy estoy aquí para dar testimonio sobre la importancia de la iniciativa de desarrollo de jornaleros y jornaleras. Los centros de jornaleros como la Colmena que ayudan a nuestra comunidad que están en las calles de Staten Island y pedirles que continúen su apoyo a quienes todos los días salen a buscar un trabajo digno. Los centros de jornaleros son un santuario para nosotros sobre todo en estos tiempos de tanto ataque a nuestra comunidad migrante y son un lugar para socializar sobre todo trabajadores que están aquí sin su familia. Nos ayudamos mutuamente en temporadas difíciles como falta de trabajo en el invierno o festividades como fiesta de fin de año y cumpleaños y mucho más. Today I'm here to give testimony of the importance of the Day Labor Workforce Initiative. Day Labor Centers like La Colmena that help the Day Labor community that is on the streets of Staten Island and ask you to continue supporting our community that every day goes out to work, to look for a dignified job. Day Labor Centers are a sanctuary for us, especially in these times of so much attack against our migrant community and a place to socialize, especially workers who are here without their family. And we can help each other and we can help each other in difficult seasons like lack of work in the winter times or festivities like holiday season, birthdays, etc. Y gracias por el apoyo ya entregado y en nombre de los jornaleros de Staten Island les pedimos que continúen apoyándonos.
con los fondos necesarios para que nuestros centros sigan creciendo y sirviendo a nuestra comunidad y a los que nos contratan. Gracias. Thank you for the support already given, and on behalf of the Staten Island Day Laborers, we ask you to continue to support us with the necessary funds so that our centers continue to grow and support our community and those who hire us. Thank you. Muchas gracias. ¿Quién quiere seguir? Hello. Hello. Mm -hmm. um, good afternoon. My name is Sylvia Flores, and I'm a member of the Worker Center at the Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrants' Rights an organization that for over 35 years has been providing high quality, trustworthy immigration related legal services to the immigrant community. The Northern Manhattan Coalition for the Immigrants' Rights is a nonprofit organization <coughs> founded in 1982 to educate, defend, and protect the rights of immigrants through direct services, civic, en civic engagement, community organizing, and advocacy. The, wor the Worker Center grew out of the community um, sorry, <laughs> services, and we have created a safe space for workers looking for better job opportunities and a trustworthy place to receive critical OSHA and know your rights trainings. I migrated to, the, to New York City from Ecuador approximately 20 years ago. Like most immigrants, I'm not, I'm not afraid of work or hard work, and I'm not afraid of different kinds of work. As a result, I have worked as a waitress and as a maintenance office cleaner. When I work in, a, in the restaurant industry, I have my wages stolen from my boss, from me by my boss. I endured sexual harassment from clients and managers, and I had to withstand verbal abuse from managers. I remember one manager telling, me, telling all of us, because you are illegals, you are, you are less intelligent, and don't try going to a government agency to get help, because you have no status, you have no rights. No one will listen to you. I had another manager, Joe, you are, f you are an idiot, you are wor worth nothing. I was like living in a toxic hell. About a year ago, I learned about the Northern Manhattan Coalition, um, Coalition for Immigrant Rights Worker Center through one of the Facebook, uh, Facebook postings. At that time, I was working as an independent contractor and the Facebook posted invi invited community members to attend a Know Your Rights training. Even though I feel that I knew about workers' rights, this particular Know Your Rights meeting really opened my eyes to additional rights that we, as workers, have in New York City. It was also in this meeting that I heard for the first time the term OSHA. I wanted to learn more about the OSHA and I, and I, I'm sorry, I wanted to learn more about what OSHA was and I decided to sign up for the OSHA 10, OSHA 10 training at the Northern Manhattan, was holding the following weekend. The OSHA training was another eye-opening experience for me. For example, during that training, I learned about how to handle chemicals safely. This is very important to understand because it provides us with the knowledge we need to stay safe while cleaning house houses or clearing newly constructed buildings. But not only were the learning and important te technical information, we were creating a community thanks to the compassionate and respectful environment that the North Manhattan Coalition for the Immigrant, Immigrant Rights Workers Center promotes. It was this that motivated me to return on a weekly, weekly basis to participate in advocacy meetings where our experiences and perspective led me to the decision-making process when strategizing and executing an action. After a norm, number of months, I asked the Worker Center director if I could volunteer in the legal department of the NMCIR. And that is when he invited me to apply interview the position of worker center assistant and job dispatcher, a position made possible through the city council funding. From this new position, I worked side by side with our worker center members, helping them seeking dignified employment, linking them to the North Manhattan Coalition for immigrants' rights, vital legal and educational services, and facilitating Know Your Rights workshops. We are part of the coalition that makes up the, labor, uh, the Day Labor Workforce Initiative. The initiative partners include, include Worker um, Justice Project, the New Immigrant Community Empowerment, Staten Island Community Job Center, and Catholic Charities. 
each of which has a long history of engaging immigrant communities and working with day laborers in all five boroughs. The Day Labor Workforce Development Initiative came together to address the needs of this underserved population, services that are even more essential now than ever before. As members of the city informal workforce, day laborers experienced rampant wage theft, I'm sorry, pervasive construction accidents, workforce hazards, lacks of a workforce development training, and lack of infrastructure. The initiative goal is to address these issues by linking the day laborers to vital services, providing tra trainings on workforce safety and legal rights, addressing wage theft, providing access to jobs, and most importantly, creating safe and dignified spaces for day laborers to congregate as they search for gainful work. New York City has the potential to lead the nation in the fight for day laborers' rights. We're thankful for the support that City Council provided the initiative for fiscal year 19, and we urge the Council to invest $3.6 million in the day labor for, for workforce initiative for the next fiscal year. Can I stop you there? Yes. Um, I think that's a good place to stop, the $3.6 million. Um, and I think that that's more than we've allocated before, so we're gonna, talk, we're gonna wanna talk about that too, so you can talk a little bit about the initiative. Um, I'm gonna ask the next person to okay. to go because I have I have your testimony, and we're, we're gonna go through a lot of a lot of testimony today. So I wanna I wanna see if I can keep you shorter, as well. Si te puedes para presentar primer primero con tu nombre y. Bueno, muchas gracias y muy buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Mi nombre es Prospero Martínez. Soy miembro del proyecto de justicia laboral. Agradezco sinceramente la oportunidad y el espacio que nos brinda el Comité de Inmigración del Consejo Municipal de esta ciudad de Nueva York, pues hace posible que nuestras voces sean escuchadas y se tomen en cuenta los intereses de la comunidad inmigrante y de los trabajadores. A finales de 2018 dejé mi tierra en Oaxaca, México, huyendo de la violencia y la persecución política. Afortunadamente en esta ciudad de Nueva York encontré la oportunidad de vivir y trabajar dignamente para seguir proveyendo a mi familia lo poco y lo mucho que se pueda ganar. Cuando llegué a Nueva York, empecé a trabajar en la construcción para cubrir las necesidades básicas de supervivencia en esta ciudad. En enero del 2019, yo en, en mi trabajo asistí como parte de un trabajo de demolición, sin las medidas de seguridad, en donde finalmente tuve un accidente de trabajo y que a estas alturas estoy enfrentando tanto el proceso legal como la etapa de recuperación. El contratista nunca le importó, a pesar de las recomendaciones que le pude yo hacer, no hubo arnés, no hubo las medidas básicas de seguridad. Y bueno, finalmente lo único que me ofreció es que me podía llevar al hospital, pero que no llamara a la ambulancia. En fin, en estos momentos, pues el proyecto de justicia laboral como tal está dándome esa asistencia como organización. Esta es la realidad diaria de miles de trabajadores en esta ciudad, el trabajador inmigrante no solo enfrenta la lucha por la vida cotidiana, sino que también carga su pasado y se plantea muchas veces un futuro incierto. Pues ha establecido una vida en donde se desarrolla como ser humano a través del trabajo, su familia y sus obligaciones sociales, luchando constantemente por mejorar sus condiciones de vida. Sin embargo, la realidad va más allá cuando se enfrenta las diversas problemáticas que por la condición de inmigrante queda limitado en muchos ámbitos, aunado a la poca o no la educación básica que haya recibido. Se llega al grado de desconocer incluso los derechos humanos que esta gran ciudad de Nueva York garantiza ampliamente. Los centros de trabajadores como el proyecto de justicia laboral juegan un papel importante en que el trabajador y el jornalero conozca sus derechos y los diversos programas que implementa el gobierno de la ciudad de Nueva York. Y de paso te, tiene el respaldo de una comunidad organizada, para reclamar su dignidad y poder trabajar con un salario digno y mejores condiciones de trabajo y también para satisfacer las necesidades básicas. Los centros, como lo es el proyecto de justicia laboral, son el espacio idóneo o el medio que está al alcance del inmigrante, pues a través del centro estoy seguro de que siempre vamos a recibir el apoyo ahí. En estos momentos libro una batalla legal, la recuperación, 
por parte de los médicos, ellos han proporcionado ese acompañamiento moral. Pero también ahí es donde yo pude recibir mi OSHA 30 de manera gratuita, mi Skeofold de, de cuatro horas y otros talleres que se han implementado. El trabajo hace que hacen los centros, por ejemplo, como proyecto de justicia laboral, es importante para esta ciudad. Los trabajadores jornaleros necesitamos y dependemos de los centros, porque solamente ahí es donde podemos empezar a conocer nuestros derechos, para que los empleadores puedan cumplir cabalmente lo que son sus obligaciones también. Un ejemplo de esto es, nuestro centro ha logrado establecer un salario mínimo de 20 dólares por hora y hace que el contratista también firme un, un contrato para que el trabajador tenga o pueda acceder a los derechos. En el año fiscal 2020 se quiere lograr o se pretende lograr tener más capacitaciones que nos permitan aprender nuevas disciplinas en la construcción, así que tales como electricidad, plomería, instalación de paneles solares, entre otros, y crear las oportunidades para también las compañeras que hoy en día también incursionan en el tema de la construcción. De acuerdo a los análisis, para que centros funcionen adecuadamente, este año se necesita un total de 3.6 millones para que se beneficien a más personas con más talleres de entrenamiento, orientación legal, así como la información sobre sus derechos humanos. Por eso hoy me dirijo a ustedes, miembros del Comité de Inmigración del Consejo Municipal, con el debido respeto, y a usted, estimado concejal Carlos Menchaca, para que consideren esta petición, pues es cierto, ese beneficio es para los que ahora formamos parte de esta gran ciudad, que a través de los centros de trabajadores con proyecto de justicia laboral sabremos de nuestros derechos, tendremos la orientación legal y recibiremos diferentes talleres para ser mejor, mejores en el ámbito laboral y seguir, seguir construyendo juntos esta gran ciudad, la ciudad de Nueva York, en donde se respeta íntegramente al ser humano. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Yeah, I know, I wanted to clap too. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can read Would it. Would you like me to yeah, re read it translate? in English, please? Um, yes. My name is Maria Valdez. I'm here to translate for Prospero. Thank you, thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Prospero Martinez and I'm a member of Workers' Justice Project. I deeply appreciate the opportunity and space that you have provided us on the New York City Council on Immigration to make possible for our voices to be heard so that our interests in general from the immigrant community and the workers are taken into account. By the end of 2018, I had to leave Oaxaca, Mexico of the United States, running away from the violence, crime, and pre persecution in New York. I found the opportunity to live without fear and to be able to work decently <coughs> to provide a better life for my family. When I came to New York, I began working in construction without fear, but with a lot of necessity to be able to cover the basic expenses of survival, survival in this city. So expensive for working people, like rent, food, public transportation, and other basic necessities. On January 2019, a contractor hired me to do a demolition on a building in the Bronx. On this job, the contractor made me demolish at height without using any protection against falls. Before I began the job, I asked the contractor to provide me with harness, but he denied to do so. Making fun of my necessity, he told me that the job was not for a whole year, it was for a day. He told me that if I didn't like it, I could leave. In that moment, I thought on leaving, but I decided to finish my day and I did not come back the following day. While I was working at Heights, I stepped on a wooden board that was unstable and fell off with the board on the first floor. In that moment, I felt a lot of pain in my arm, back and legs. The contractor didn't care about my pain. He took me out from the work site and offered me to take me to a clinic. Without being able to get up and with an, an endless pain, I asked him to call an ambulance, but he denied. He insisted not to call anyone, that he could take me to a clinic. Without being able to get up and with a, a lot of pain, I called the ambulance, while the employer went out to hide in, in his car. This is the daily reality of hundreds of workers in this city. 
the immigrant worker not only faces a struggle for daily life, but also with the burden of the past and with an uncertain future that has established a life where it develops as human being through work, family, and social obligations, constantly fighting to improve conditions of life. But nevertheless, the, reala the reality goes beyond when we face a diversity of problems. For being an immigrant, it is limited, limited in many areas, coupled with little or no basic e education received. It reaches to the point to ignore our human rights that this big city offers. So I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop you there. We had because we have the English version, mm -hmm. but I'm I'm glad that we were able to hear his story in English. Um, and Prospero Martinez, muchas gracias por, por tu palabras y um, what? Oh, and actually we have one more. One nice. Okay, L let's hear from from nice as well. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Eh, antes que nada, muchísimas gracias este, por permitirnos la oportunidad de estar aquí escuchando nuestros testimonios. Eh, mi nombre es Oswaldo Mendoza. Yo pertenezco a la organización New Immigrant Community Empowerment, NICE. Eh, conocí la organización de NICE en la, parada de, en la parada de jornaleros en Woodside, Queens, hace ya varios años. Llevo viviendo en este país aproximadamente 20 años y 15 de ellos eh, trabajando en lo que es este, construcción. Eh, este es mi testimonio acerca de los abusos que sufrimos como trabajadores inmigrantes en la industria de la construcción, a la cual pertenezco. Y por tal cual estoy aquí hoy para apoyar la iniciativa de jornaleros y jornaleras, que es la manera principal para que nosotros enfrentemos estos abusos. Eh, como parte de NICE, He sido testigo de incontables casos de abusos laborales, tales como el robo de salario y violaciones en lo que se refiere a salud y seguridad en la industria. Cuando llegué a NICE, en los primeros meses recibí mucha información muy necesaria para mí sobre lo que es los derechos de los trabajadores, como aún siendo inmigrantes, eh, acerca de cómo protegerme, cómo buscar ayuda tanto en las agencias de la ciudad como en organizaciones comunitarias. Fui entrenado en cursos de salud y seguridad y en prácticas para la lucha de los derechos en el sitio de trabajo, para mí y para mis compañeros. En los últimos años he impartido esta informe, información a miembros nuevos de la comunidad inmigrante. En el año 2013 yo sufrí un accidente de construcción y actualmente sigo en rehabilitación con un 90% de posibilidades de que tenga que operarme de la columna. Eh, no soy el primero y seguramente que no seré el último que sufre este tipo de accidentes por la negligencia de algunos empleadores. Tenemos que ser conscientes y reconocer que existen y han existido por mucho tiempo mucha explotación por parte de los empleadores hacia los trabajadores. Como organización hemos combativo, combatido estos abusos ofreciendo apoyo legal a víctimas, proveyendo cursos de salud y seguridad y entrenamientos de aprendizaje para los trabajadores en la industria de la construcción. El año pasado, NICE entrenó a más trabajadores que en todos los años anteriores, más de 1,300 personas. Eh, hemos luchado para ofrecer mayor acceso a estos entrenamientos en la comunidad, pero el entrenamiento no basta, desgraciadamente. En los últimos 10 años han muerto casi 500 trabajadores en esta industria. No vamos tan lejos, apenas la, la semana pasada Murió un hermano nuestro de, de, que trabajaba en la construcción, eh, ecuatoriano él. Este, eh, la gran mayoría de, de estos trabajadores inmigrantes como yo. Ahora, con ICE y sus miembros, estamos encabezando una campaña para traer reformas que protejan a los trabajadores de la construcción. Tenemos que reconocer que existe una correlación entre violaciones de salud y seguridad y el robo de salario teniendo como común denominador a los empleadores y responsables. Por eso, hoy y aquí, pedimos que nuestros concejales nos ayuden a sacar a estos, a estos empleadores y responsables fuera de la industria para que no sigan robándonos, para que no nos sigan abusando o poniéndonos en peligro de accidentarnos o de muerte. Hoy, más que nunca, necesitamos mayor protección en contra de estos empleadores 
que solo buscan enriquecerse a, cosa, a costa de nosotros los trabajadores. Les agradezco a, a ustedes, concejales, y sobre todo al honorable Carlos Menchaca, por recibir mi testimonio y tomarlo en cuenta para que sigan apoyando esta iniciativa tan importante para los las y los trabajadores inmigrantes aquí en Nueva York. En esta época de xenofobia en la que estamos viviendo, tenemos que aumentar el apoyo que esta gran ciudad aporta a nuestras comunidades inmigrantes. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias. Y queremos ayudar y apoyar y, y entrar en la campaña de, de los empleados. Bueno, ¿lo, lo tienen en ICE o es, es parte de la coalición grande? ¿Es algo que todos los, todos las organizaciones están haciendo esta campaña? Eh, sí, 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 es parte, bueno. somos parte de la coalición. Queremos apoyar. Parte. Queremos apoyar. Muchísimas gracias. Um, And I just wanted to say that um, uh, Oswaldo Mendoza talked a, li a little bit about the work that NICE is doing to really confront the labor abuses that are happening with, uh, within NICE as an organization. But this is a coalition effort to really confront irresponsible employers who are connected to wage thefts, safety. And we heard from all, all of our, our day laborers about that issue. I think what I want to I want to just bring to, to light here is what we had just heard from the administration about how we bring more funding, the funding that that they're asking for. Actually, this is a question I want you to answer because I think it's better coming from you. Um, who funds this initiative, this day labor workforce initiative? Who funds it? Can you put it on? I, we need this record. Put it. On. So right now, the, 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 the initiative is being funded by the city council for the past three years. Do you get any funding from the mayor's office to do day labor workforce initiative no. work? No. No, not, not us. And would us. you like for it to come from the mayor's office in a three-year contract, which is called baselining? At some point, yes, uh, because it's uh, for us as an organization, it's very difficult uh, to plan ahead when we don't know if we are going to be either refunded or at what levels every year. So it's... Um, uh, obviously that is a cost to the workers because we don't know if we're going to be able to operate, we're going to be able to open the centers, we're not going to be able to pay the staff, uh, and as you also mentioned earlier, with the contracting process also uh, makes it even uh, 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 more of a headache for us. Right, because the council funding is one-year funding, and a baseline project, like some of the adult literacy, not all of it, but some of it is a three-year contract, which means that you can plan ahead as an organization and grow And, and so I will note that you're asking for more money than the council has given in the past year. Can you talk a little bit about what that extra funding will go to uh, for this initiative? So right now, uh, with this initiative, we've been able to open uh, a day labor centers in each borough, but in the Bronx yet. Uh, so right now, from having no centers funded by the city uh, in three years, we now can say we have five centers, including a center for uh, women day laborers in, in, in Brooklyn. Uh, that they can talk more about. Uh, so that's has be, that is the increase. So also with this increase, we're going to be able to fund a day labor center in the Bronx, making it a truly citywide initiative uh, where in each borough there is a designated uh, city-funded day labor center for all the workers in that borough. And my, um, my last question is, is about census and how important that is. So can, can anyone tell me a little bit about how important the census is? Um, sí, y, sí, lo los, los gobierno. Yo creo que es demasiado importante tener un censo y saber eh, realmente qué cantidad de, de, de trabajadores están en cada una de las industrias para así poder repartir esos fondos a cada una de ellas. Claro, eh, siempre y cuando tomando en cuenta, eh, como decía yo, eh, la seguridad, eh, el, el bienestar, no solo de los trabajadores, sino de todas las familias de ellos. Ok. So, it's like, it's really important uh, for workers um, from every industry, uh, not just for the workers, but for the families that are part of the workers. Um, y, ¿Y qué van a hacer ustedes como trabajadores o ser parte de esta iniciativa para ser contados en, en el census? ¿Qué van a hacer ustedes? Yo, perdón, ¿qué vamos a hacer? Perdón, no, no entendí bien la pregunta. ¿Cómo? 
oh, ¿qué vamos a hacer para apoyar este censo? Eh, bueno, una, una propuesta sería eh, dar, dar talleres de lo importante que estos son, son estos censos a todos nuestros miembros, eh, individualmente, en cada, en cada uno de, nuestro, de nuestros centros de trabajo. Ya lo hacemos con otros... Eh, con otras cosas como este, eh, entrenamientos, ¿por qué no hacerlo para hacerles saber, darles información acerca de lo importante que son estos censos? Thank you, and I think what um, Oswaldo was talking about is, uh, in my response to what are the workers going to do to help help the census conversation, is that they, and the key thing he said here was they already do a lot of workshops. You heard from all the workers about OSHA. And we just created a law last year that a lot of you were, were really at the table helping us construct that's bringing construction safety standards at 50 hours across the entire uh, worker workforce. You're already talking to people. There's already relationship and trust. And you can use those spaces to bring census messages to your workers, your brothers and sisters who are on the ground. And this is the message that we need to send to the administration and how important it is to fund CBOs like you to do the census work. Because if, we ha if everything you just talked about, getting safety standards up across the board and fighting uh, for contracts with uh, uh, developers to, to good, get good salary and fight your salaries because they're getting stolen and on top of all that to do census is not it's not, that's the immoral uh, question here if we don't answer it with yes, funding to you all. So that's, that's just the point that I wanted to make here. Um, and if there's any final thoughts, I'm gonna move to the next panel. Any other final thoughts? Eh, perdón. Eh, yo creo que una de las, de las cosas eh, que influyen mucho en, en que nosotros como trabajadores inmigrantes no quieramos por la desinformación, no quieramos ser parte de ese censo, es el mismo miedo que, en el que estamos viviendo, el mismo ambiente que, en el que se está viviendo. So, muchas veces por la desinformación es que no, se, no queremos ser parte de eso. Eh, nosotros como, como organizaciones eh, tenemos el derecho, el deber de, de informar que no es así. Es para un beneficio, más que nada. Let me just tra translate really quick. Uh, Oswaldo was saying how important it is that the, the reason people, the immigrants don't want to get involved in the census is because of the fear and, and really through the workshops that you can do is, is, is to change that mind so that people understand that this is a benefit to the city if people get counted in the census. And again, that message can't come just from us as government. It has to come from our partners on the ground. Uh, bueno. Por eso es importante para nosotros que estos centros sigan eh, siendo el intermediario para que pueda, eh, exactamente, para que se pueda armar un censo. Para ello se necesita impulsar o implementar un programa y a través de los compañeros, como lo decía el compañero Osvaldo, nosotros que conocemos la parada, podemos invitar a los compañeros y obviamente a través de los centros se puede empezar a crear una base de datos que obviamente va a llevar todo un proceso porque si bien es cierto, no todos le tendríamos, al principio no todos le tenemos confianza a nadie. Y entonces, a medida que hay nuevos inmigrantes o aún personas que ya llevan años acá, también le tienen temor por, por alguna razón, ¿no? Pero sí sería bueno y benéfico porque entonces más o menos la ciudad tendría una idea también clara de cuántos inmigrantes están trabajando sin los conocimientos de sus derechos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Prospero. Uh, Martínez. Así es. Um, and I think the only, the, the nugget that I want to pull out from what Prospero said is they, they know their corners, the day labor corners, they know the workers. And, and yeah, everybody has a sense of, of distrust of everything, right? Like we, we, I think we sometimes start with distrust, but they know their workers, they know their, their corners, they can talk to the workers and the workers have families and we can get everybody counted. So thank you, thank you. Last word. No, I just wanted to agree with the workers. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, this, the day labor community is one of the hardest to reach New Yorkers community deemed like that. Also with all of the controversies around the census and the question about citizenship and now the immigrant community across the country being fearful of 
uh, having any type of uh, information given to the government is going to take a real effort to make sure that everybody's counted uh, this time around. Uh, and as the worker said, you know, we know our workers, we know the corners, we're able to talk to them, we're able to make sure that they're trusting, you know, to make sure that this information is not going to go anywhere else, just to make sure that New York City gets the fair share uh, of resources because of the census. Thank you. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Otro mensaje. So basically, I guess, as organizations, we can work, we're more close close working with the community, so I guess they feel more connected to us, and basically they could come to us, and as an organization, we could work together to educate our community better and inform them, so they lose that kind of like fear that they have about the census. Exactly, thank you. Thank you for your time. I'm gonna call the next panel, and on that note, what I wanna say is, um, uh, the, Well, I'll, I'll keep bits of my final thought, actually. I'll, I'll, hold, I'll hold my thought. Uh, Esmeralda Flores from WCBDI, Brightly Cleaning Co-op. Uh, Christina Fox from NYC NEWC. Now? Oh, Nick Knock, yes, of course. Come on over. Uh, Ralph uh, Palladino. Jesse Lehman. Okay, thank you. Let's get started. Who, who wants to start? Okay. It's a red light. Is it on? Can there. you hear me now? Great, thank you. So yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Menchaca and the rest of the uh, City Council Committee on Immigration. Thank you for hearing our testimony today. My name's Christina. I'm here on behalf of NICNOC, the New York City of worker cooperatives, and also on behalf of WCBDI, the Worker Cooperative Business uh, Development Initiative. So you have our testimony in front of you. I won't take too much time to boast about our accomplishments. You know, in five short years, being able to organize hundreds of jobs, start 130 cooperatives amongst the 14 organizations that make up the initiative. I could go on and on, and you can see in the testimony the real benefits and tangible benef benefits and impact on the worker owners themselves who are primarily and large majority immigrants and women of color. Um, but what I'm actually gonna take the time here today is to really share with you all why co-ops are beyond being good business, actually because they're ba value-based businesses based in justice, equity, and opportunity, really actually are what can push your policy priorities forward and help connect the dots in ways that none of us could ever imagine. Um, so a good example of this is, uh, you know, you mentioned in the last testimony and at the day labors, uh, the uh, intro 1447 in local law uh, for OSHA increased OSHA training in the city. So in that same year, 2017, uh, the Brooklyn Bangladeshi community mourned the loss of Sirajul Hulk, who uh, passed away on Father's Day after falling off of a scaffold in Brooklyn. Um, at that same time is when intro 1447 and local law passed to help increase that training, really to protect workers like, like him and like this community. Today, now, this same community is really struggling to get access to these trainings by a trainer who is authorized in the language that they speak and with materials in Bangla. Um, 
that, that doesn't just mean lack of access to training. At this point with this new law, it puts their jobs at risk and their ability to continue to work at risk. So who fills this gap, you might wonder, and I'll tell you who. It's the immigrant-led OSHA co-op Action OSH. And so this is a really good example of really how this embeddedness and this connectedness and community can come together. So Action OSH has partnered in the last year or so with uh, drum, Desi's Rising Up and Moving, and working with their members in Kensington. We're really proud to say that we're going to be offering, in partnership with them, the first ever 30-hour Bangla language OSHA training. We've translated our 180-page uh, participant manual, right, that um, is for the first time, you know, this is, this is not information available by OSHA or anybody else in this language. We were able to translate it by the help of Scenic, the Cooperative Alliance of New York City, with a micro grant. And so you can see how all of these things connect to really push things forward. This is important for Action OSH because of our own histories with uh, you know, organizing and access for OSHA in Spanish language. So it's really important and exciting for us to be able to extend this olive branch. So we ask you, you know, it wasn't OSHA, it wasn't Department of Buildings, it wasn't anybody other than the connectedness of the co-op ecosystem and the co-op community that can not only make wonderful, uh, you know, opportunities for business ownership and sustainable jobs, like Esmeralda will share with you, but also really deeply impact in ways that we can't uh, do on our own. So we do want to ask uh, the City Council to please enhance the WCBDI initiative. Uh, we, we're looking for an enhancement to $4.8 billion for fiscal year 2020. Um, this is going to help us respond to the growing interest from worker centers uh, across the city, as well as different CBOs, unions, and academic institutions who are interested in developing cooperatives in their communities and to make this lasting impact. So remind us, uh, who, who, where's the funding come from? This funding is coming from the city council on a yearly basis. Thank you. I'm just going to be asking that question over and over Absolutely. again. Absolutely. Glad to answer it. <laughs> Thank you. Buenas tardes. Eh, honorable Carlos Menchaca. Um, distinguidos miembros del Comité de Migración de la Ciudad de Nueva York. Mi nombre es Esmeralda Flores. Um, soy una trabajadora dueña de la cooperativa Prailing. Carol Garden, les quiero dar las gracias por invertir en las familias de la comunidad de las organizaciones. Estoy muy nerviosa, ¿verdad? Pero um, hoy estoy muy feliz porque estamos teniendo el segundo año de, de la cooperativa buscando... Bueno, yo no buscaba iniciar una cooperativa, yo buscaba solo un, nego un trabajo, pero empecé yendo a la vida familiar, um, asistiendo en, en la vida familiar, en el CFL. Empecé y entendí que era una cooperativa. Entonces, ahora soy tesorera de la propia cooperativa y me siento muy contenta por eso porque a través de eso hemos, hemos logrado pues estar en la este trabajaba antes en una en trabajo normal verdad pero estando en la cooperativa hemos iniciado una nueva, empezado un nuevo inicio. ¿Sí? Bueno, pues yo trabajaba antes en una normal como todos, ¿verdad? Tal vez venimos de unos trabajos que no son bien pagados, no te valoran, no te respetan, pero y sabemos que aquí en en la ciudad de Nueva York las viviendas son muy caras y pues con ese saldo no, no, no podemos ahorrar un poco y entonces a través de la, de la cooperativa hemos podido, um, vemos que sí podemos ahorrar para un futuro para nuestros hijos. 
Entonces, les doy las gracias a las personas que, que nos ayudan en que sea esto posible, la cooperativa. Entonces, a través de NICNAC y de OpenGo, la cooperativa ahora eh, somos la primera cooperativa que pertenecemos a una franquicia, somos este, primera franquicia. Entonces, estamos en una franquicia ahora, en la hora en Estados Unidos. Somos la primera cooperativa en la franquicia. Entonces, estamos muy contentos por eso. Y pues les quiero dar las gracias a todos que nos han seguido apoyando. Y pues estoy muy contenta por eso. Y gracias a ustedes pueden las familias hacer realidad sus sueños. Y como el mío es estar aquí y pertenecer a una cooperativa, gracias a mi hija, que mi hija me ha impulsado a seguir adelante. No ha sido fácil pertenecer a la cooperativa, pero gracias a mi hija estoy aquí y puedo decirles muchas gracias por ayudarnos y darnos estos entrenamientos que ha sido posible gracias a ustedes. Y muchas gracias a usted también por estar aquí con su voz, representando todo Um, todas que están parte de esta cooperativa um, y, y es bueno escuchar directamente de usted que está trabajando um, y bueno, eso es algo muy importante por, por ese proceso de democracia no <ríe> y por, muchas gracias por, por su tiempo y tengo una pregunta para usted um, estamos hablando del census 2020 y 2020 y ¿Qué, ¿Qué piensa usted en, en activar todos los que están trabajando con usted uh -huh. en, el, en, en la cooperativa y ser parte de esto, um, esta iniciativa para contar cada persona en la ciudad? Eh, que sean más, seamos más sociables con las personas y ayudemos más a la comunidad más que nada. Uh -huh. Porque como le digo, uh, allá afuera son mal pagados nuestro trabajo, y ahora que somos parte de la franquicia, la cooperativa ha tenido más, hemo, hemos visto que nuestras familias podemos ser más beneficiadas y así ayudar a nuestros hijos que tengan un estudio. Y al ver a sus papás que ellos eh, buscan más oportunidades, ellos también buscan oportunidades y a través de eso pues dejar un mejor futuro para nos, nuestros hijos también. Y ustedes pueden correr la voz y claro, uno con tras relaciones uh -huh. y qué bueno, qué bueno. Bueno, eso es, es, la tema de de, todos, es la tema de nuestra conversación. Gracias. <risa> ustedes tienen el poder y la confianza de, del pueblo. Sí, a nombre de todas mis, mis compañeras, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a ustedes también. Um, is there English testimony that is getting submitted? Do we know? Oh, I have yours. I have yours. Yeah, Esmeralda. We also submitted. Okay. Do I have that? Oh, here it is. Here you go. Boom. Okay. Muchas gracias. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Esmeralda. Okay. Good day. My name is Ralph Palladino, second vice president, local 1549, clerical administrative employees, representing 14,000 city workers in the city of New York providing services in 911, 311, Medicaid and SNAP um, eligibility and public hospitals. Um, we're asking you to, number one, I'm skipping around. We're asking you to support New York City Cares, the health initiative by the mayor, which is excellent, which is gonna mainly target immigrants who service them, though it'll service many others. Um, and we also ask you to reach out to the state in the budget process to support New York City health and hospitals. Medicaid funding at the state level is not meeting the cost of care for NYC H&H. &H. Disproportionate share DISH funding is not fairly distributed and is ending soon. So we ask you to reach out to the state and, and support these programs now. H&H &H has to survive. Uh, immigrant people and need health care. We don't want a pandemic, an epidemic, because of short-sightedness and people being denied their health care rights. In terms of the second thing, the need for improvement in language services um, for immigrants. The influx of immigrants from all over the world using city services is great. This requires that communication efforts be enhanced. In some cases, this can mean life and death. This is especially true in healthcare settings. 
I'm a healthcare worker, by the way. Currently, the city contracts out to private vendors, interpreter, and language services. It is done by phone. This is providing inadequate service to those who need this service. Obviously, we can see that today. It's much better to have someone here than someone on a phone. The New York Immigration Coalition has documented that the most efficient way to provide language interpretation is face-to-face, -face, especially with the Asian communities. This service should be performed by city employees, not private phone line employees. We hear stories from our members working in hospitals, SNAP, and Medicaid about wrongful advice and interpretations being performed uh, at times. The best way to have total quality control and to deliver the service is by using the civil service interpreter title throughout the city. In eight New York City H&H, &H, this can be done by client navigators. Interpreters can do face-to-face -face interpretation. They also can interpret documents and assist those who are applying for benefits and providing application filing information. I refer you to the New York State Report on Social Services chaired by the then Senator Avella that summarized the importance and need for interpreters. So finally, I just want to say, because it's upsetting, that there are 3 million immigrants and 750,000 undocumented in New York City. Like the Italian, Irish, and other immigrants, my forefathers, in the 17, 18 and 1900s who came to this country legally and illegally, they worked to provide services, goods, and help build our city. They are taxpayers contributing to the economy and social life of our city. They have a human right to services that their, tax pay, that their taxes help provide. Their, ta their taxes help provide. This includes services such as health care and language interpretation. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Palladino, for your, for your words. And I, I just want to say that I, I, I enjoyed listening to all the, all the pieces. What I want to lift really quick is the interpretation piece that you spoke about and how important that is to have a face-to-face -face conversation um, and to have people and interpreters uh, within the confines of spaces where, we're, where democracy is happening. There's this really great idea that I hope you can get behind of an interpreter bank where essentially we can bring another cooperative uh, uh, style model to hire people to do this work in our communities, in our community boards, here, everywhere, where we can kind of go and get. So anyway, that's an idea that we've heard so far. And so know that a lot of people are thinking about this with you and that you're joining a chorus of, of, of New Yorkers that are asking for this kind of thing. Sure, go ahead. That is a good idea except for one thing. Oh, tell the me. Problem, well, to consider, the problem that we hear in Medicaid eligibility and SNAP eligibility is that you're on a phone line with somebody who doesn't, not from the agency, does not know the rules and regulations dealing with Medicaid eligibility or in, in SNAP eligibility, and sometimes that person on the phone and someone has to be denied or needs other documents and stuff, it's like a miscommunication goes on. Mm -hmm. And so it's much better to have someone who's familiar with some of the legal requirements of some of these services. We don't want to get into a situation where this present administration in Washington, God help us, the wall building and everything else and denying people rights, uh, comes down and says you're, you know, there's because of mistakes yeah. that happen right. that your fraud is going on. Do you understand? And these kind of programs and not give an excuse to those wrongful people who want to destroy these programs. We're thinking of that too. I'm just cautioning on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. We We're can thinking work about with that you, too. Because we that's about training. the city interpreter title. That's about training as well. Thank you. Is, is Moya in the house? If, if you're from Moya, thank you. One person? Thank you so much for being here. Uh, okay. Sure. Jesse. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Menchaca, uh, uh, for holding this hearing on the city's budget and how it affects immigrant communities. And thank you, in fact, for the existence of this committee that can uh, raise these issues and hear from these voices and address you know, how the city uh, interacts with immigrant communities. It's a really cr critical committee for us to have. Um, my name is Jesse Lehman. I'm the Director of Policy at the Employment and Training Coalition. Uh, we are an association that represents over 150 community-based organizations, educational institutions, and labor unions that provide job training and employment services to more than half a million New Yorkers a year. And so I'll be focusing my testimony on how this year's city budget can address income inequality and chronic poverty among New York's immigrants. Uh, and I have three, uh, in my written remarks here, three recommendations that I'll briefly summarize for you. But before I 
do that. I want to actually draw attention to something that's not in our written remarks um, because these, these are things that we've been going to multiple committees about. But in, in this committee, I wanted to particularly also raise uh, that several of our member organizations have worked with or sponsored worker co-ops uh, and that we think from, from our experience and in my opinion that the, the growth and rise of worker co-ops in New York over the last few years is an inspiring and really critical development uh, for workers empowerment and rights in general and for e economic opportunities but especially for workers in sectors that are traditionally uh, sort of uh, disenfranchised and don't have a lot of power relative to their employees, whether that be uh, janitorial services, healthcare services, and especially day laborers. Um, and so I want to thank you for your support of co-ops and for the day laborer centers uh, and the council's support, and I urge the administration to get with the program uh, and baseline the funding that is necessary uh, to make programs like that uh, live on. Uh, so now briefly, my three recommendations around this, uh, this year's budget. Uh, number one that we have is that it is time for the city to finally fully invest in bridge programming for marginalized communities. Uh, the number one thing that we hear from worker uh, workforce development providers is that uh, too many of the clients that come in their doors have foundational skills deficits, literacy, numeracy, English language skills. Uh, the, the administration knows this. They promised $60 million for bridge programs that would address these issues a few years back. 2020 was the year that they promised to get to $60 million in annual funding. So this is the year we want them to keep that promise. Uh, and we want to urge the city council to put that in the budget response and fight for $60 million for bridge programs. Uh, in particular, DYCD has a new bridge program called Advance and Earn that they are proposing. That's a step in the right direction, but it needs to be funded a lot more and serve a lot more people. Um, my second recommendation, we are members of the New York City uh, Coalition for Adult Literacy and proud to be for many years, and we fully support their call once again this year for restoration of the full funding for adult basic education and baselining of the $12 million that ought to have been baselined years ago. Um, and my third recommendation, uh, we were just here a couple days ago at the Economic Development and Oversight uh, uh, hearings, and we just want to highlight that any money that the city spends on economic development and job creation in New York needs to be primarily focused on creating jobs and employment pathways for the people that need it most. Uh, and that means immigrants, for sure, uh, who represent nearly, 40, uh, nearly half of New York City's workforce, uh, but especially it means people who have educational or other foundational skills deficits. Those should be our top priority when we're spending public dollars. Thank you, and I think that rounds out this, this uh, panel. The reason we, we started with two economic engines is for that reason, that we could be spending money in the city to do good things, right. but if we're not focused on the equality question that I think this mayor was, 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 uh, was talking about a few years ago when he first ran, uh, we're, we're not focused in public for the public good. And I think you just rounded out perfect that that's where we need to be focusing our attention, our funding, uh, and I couldn't agree with you more. And so that's, that's the case we have to make across the board. So thank you thank for you. that. That was a fun hearing. And a lot of new legislative ideas came out of that for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Our next, what's the next? Our next panel is Lena Cohen uh, from United Neighbor, Neighborhood Houses of New York, um, Ira Yanquit, Caroline uh, Ioso, Guillermo Rodriguez, and Vanessa Dell. You can come on up, please. I have a feeling we're going to be talking about adult literacy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good. And if you could raise your hands, uh, if you're still waiting to testify, I just want to see who's still here. Great. Stay patient. Thank you so much. I hope you're enjoying the conversation. <laughs> Let's go. Who wants to start? Okay. So just want to begin by thanking you, Chairman Chaka, for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Ira Yanquit. I'm the Executive Director of the Literacy Assistance Center, and today I'll be testifying on behalf of the New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy, or NICAL. Um, as you already are well aware, today in New York City, there are approximately 2.2 million adults who lack English language proficiency, a high school diploma, or both, and over 75% of these are immigrants. 
Yet public funding for adult literacy education is so limited that fewer than 4% of these 2.2 million adults are able to access basic education, high school equivalency, or English language classes in any given year. NICAL wants to start by thanking you, Council Member Manchaka, for being a champion for these 2.2 million adults and for your steadfast leadership on this issue, really from day one of the time you entered the Council. And we wish to express our deep appreciation to the Council and the Mayor for the $12 million expansion of adult literacy funding and services over these past three years. Unfortunately, once again, Mayor de Blasio has failed to include this $12 million in his preliminary budget, imperiling the education of the 8,500 adult students in New York City whose programs rely on it. Moreover, as a result of changes in the Federal Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which puts an increased emphasis on employment outcomes and eliminates funding for standalone English language civics classes, an estimated 8,000 immigrant students who attended WIOA-funded civics classes in New York City prior to this past July were displaced or deemed inappropriate for WIOA-funded classes as of July 1st. It's time for the council and the administration to stand up for the thousands of New Yorkers in need and baseline the $12 million in addition to the $3.5 million currently baselined to support DYCD funded adult literacy programs. When it comes to funding for adult literacy, there are really three issues. The first is the paucity of the funding itself, which shuts the door to over 95% of those in need. The second is the unreliable nature of the current funding streams, which poses a continuous threat to program stability, staff continuity, and the ability to fully achieve program and policy goals. And the third is the inadequacy of the funding formulas and rates, which undermine programs' ability to provide the full array and depth of services that students need and deserve. My organization recently released a report entitled Investing in Quality, a Blueprint for Adult Literacy Programs and Funders. Funded by DYCD, the report details 14 building blocks of a comprehensive community-based adult literacy program, identifies the resources needed to fully implement the building blocks, and includes a first-of-its-kind cost model. And based on our cost model, we found that community-based adult literacy programs would need to have their current funding rates increased by at least four times in order to fully implement the components and services outlined in the report. While this might sound like a big leap, we know that at the current funding rates, many of the critical pro uh, program components that we identify, such as full-time teachers, counseling, student support services, workforce transition services, professional development and planning for staff, and integrated technology are often compromised. NICAL is calling on the City Council and the Mayor to take two crucial steps toward creating a city that truly provides quality educational opportunity for all. First, restore and baseline the $12 million for DYCD-funded adult literacy services and combine these funds with the existing $3.5 million in baseline DYCD funding. As we enter the final year under the current DYCD contracts, programs can use some of the additional baseline funds on critical short-term resources. For example, in FY 2020, programs could hire a Census 2020 coordinator to develop curriculum, educate, and do outreach to students and their families to better ensure that the most marginalized and vulnerable New Yorkers get counted or programs could purchase additional technology, expand case management capacity, receive an enhancement that incentivizes hiring full-time teachers, or pay for additional professional development. Second, as DYCD begins to draft its next RFP for multi-year funding scheduled to be released in the coming year, commit to funding programs at a rate that will better enable them to provide high-quality, comprehensive services that adult students deserve. Currently, DYCD programs provide less than $1,000 per student. NICAL is calling on DYCD to establish a rate of no less than double that amount or $2,000 for every student. Um, while this rate falls short of the level of funding called for in the Investing in Quality Report, NICAL is sensitive to the need to balance quantity with quality. With baseline funding of $15.5 million and a rate of $2,000 per student, DYCD programs would be able to, better, to serve over 7,500 students a year, maintaining capacity and increasing the quality of services. Finally, should the $12 million be baseline, NICAL urges the Council to work with the administration to ensure that all programs that receive funding for adult literacy in 2019, including those funded with discretionary dollars, are able to secure the funding they need to continue to, to provide their programming. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ira, for that. And I know that the administration said a couple things about adult literacy. Um, and actually, you know, well, I'll come back and ask the panel and see how we can openly discuss this in a way that sets us up for a baseline. Great. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Vanessa Dell, and I'm actually an immigration attorney at Make the Road New York, although I will be talking about adult literacy as well. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Make the Road and our 23,000 members. We would like to thank the City Council for supporting an increase in funding for immigrant legal services, especially over the past two years of unprecedented federal attacks on the immigrant community. 
This funding has greatly increased representation, but the need continues to grow with more cases um, becoming complicated and hard won. Um, based on the experiences of our staff and communities, we're making the following recommendations for the fiscal year 2020 budget. First, make the road and our partners are uh, requesting urgent city council funding for a, a RAIDS rapid response initiative to address increased ICE inform enforcement impacting the communities we serve. This funding would provide emergency legal support to detain community members at imminent risk of deportation who do not qualify for the knife up program. Second, we urge the City Council to increase NIFUP funding from $10 million to $16.6 million in fiscal year 2020 and immediately increase current funding by $1.5 million in light of additional detained dockets at Barrick Street Immigration Court beginning this week. At current funding levels, NIFUP providers will only staff three out of the five dockets at Barrick, leaving many who qualify for the program without legal representation. Third, we ask that the City Council allocate $5 million to renew and increase the critical funding awarded last year under the Low Wage Worker Initiative. Without renewal, vital services will need to be phased out across the city. Fourth, we request that the City Council increase its allocation for the Access Health Initiative to 2.5 million and maintain its 1.5 million allocation for the Immigrant Health Initiative. Both programs allow Make the Road and other community-based organizations to reach immigrant families about their rights and available resources and address healthcare disparities. Fifth and finally, we ask that the City Council restore and baseline 12 million in adult literacy funding so that thousands of immigrants can continue to learn English and access economic opportunity. Without restoration of this funding, 8,500 students will lose their classes this year. Thank you again for the time um, today and your ongoing leadership. Make the Road New York appreciates our partnership with everyone on this committee and um, in, you know, your, your partnership to ensure the, the respect and dignity of immigrant um, families in New York City. Thank you for that comprehensive review of all the, all the programs and uh, requests for, for baselining where it is. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Lena Cohen. I'm here on behalf of United Neighborhood Houses, the federation of 42 settlement houses across New York State. Thank you, Chairman Chaka, for having us here today to talk about specifically adult literacy and how it impacts our immigrant communities across the city. Um, with your leadership, we've, be, we've been able to make a lot of progress throughout the past few fiscal years. And uh, each year, as you know, the mayor eliminates the $12 million for community adult literacy programs. And of course, the council has been essential in helping us get that back and maintaining it. So as my colleagues have said before, we're hoping the council can help us baseline that funding, as well as address uh, the reimbursement rates issues um, that prevent providers from really being able to provide as high quality of a service with the funds provided through DYCD. So uh, there's more information on those issues in the testimony and I actually want to shift to focus on how adult literacy funding can be used for more than just uh, improving workforce development outcomes. Really adult literacy is geared toward improving a community's or and improving an, an individual's ability to integrate into all aspects of their society, whether it be through civic means, social means, or economic means. Further, adult literacy really does provide a window for talking about civic engagement effectively. When you have a classroom full of students that are looking for ways to not only improve their literacy skills to support their families, their children, talk to uh, government officials, health administrators, they're also looking for ways to build community power and speak up and be able to hold their elected officials accountable in a very transparent way. So that's where we see uh, adult literacy programs coming in as a key player in this goal that we all share to get every single New Yorker counted. As you said at the beginning of the hearing, there's so much at stake, over $800 billion worth of federal fundings over the next 10 years. New York d cannot stand to lose any of that, and that's why United Neighborhood Houses really sees the role that settlement houses and other CBOs play in promoting the 2020 census as a key way to reaching the hardest to count communities. We believe a great place to start is through adult literacy. If we're able to secure baseline funds and really make sure that that entire 12 million goes directly to the DYCD funded adult literacy contracts, then our programs will be able to plan to have a census coordinator and hold community forums that express the uh, importance of the census through culturally fluent means. So, you know, we're prepared to work with our members. We've already started a pretty uh, comprehensive outreach campaign to use what resources they have right now to address the 2020 census and 
all of our members see uh, the emerging of adult literacy programs as they relate to supporting their communities and connecting with elected officials as a way to lift up the importance of every single voice in their community. So we're excited to work with you on that and please let us know how we can partner with you moving forward. Thank you, the only thing I wanna, I wanna um, lift up in what you said is the, the connection of the census piece and I'm asking everybody that question because that, that needs to stay at the front of the work as we bring the funding in. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad to hear that adult literacy programs are already thinking about census and integrating it, but that can't happen without funding to really support that work. Um, as fragile as it is right now without the rate increases, what we don't wanna do is break the system. And so thank you for, for really laying that out for us. And I'm seeing nods across the, board, the, the table and we're not alone in that. And that's part of the argument we have to make to our, um, just not just the mayor's office of immigrant affairs, but the mayor himself and his OMB people. Mm -hmm. Great, thank, thank you. you. I'm gonna have our, our student testify first. <laughs> um, good afternoon, every, everyone. Uh, Carlos Maseca, uh, uh, every person. Uh, I share my testimony. Um, my name is Guillermo Rodriguez. I started ca coming to OBT in 2017 science, uh, then I attend in class, basic computer and financial literacy classes. My experience at OBT has uh, always been great. I had learned to speak and read English, develop my um, relationship skill. Uh, Microsoft Office, how to say money and set it a goal. I am uh, grateful for the OBT school because they offer us the opportunity to study and develop our skills for a good and better future. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Uh, and representing all the students that our initiative is funding right now in the city. Thank you. Thank you. And are you, will you be, I uh, have your testimony as well. Will you, will you be giving it? Yes. Okay, go for it. Yes. Um, well, thank you so much, Guillermo, and thank you very much, Chairman Chaka, um, for having this hearing and for allowing me the time to speak. Um, my name is Caroline Ayoso, and I am the Director of Community and Government Affairs at Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow. Um, we are a proud member of the New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy and here to also advocate for that $12 million to be uh, restored and baselined. Um, OBT is one of New York City's largest providers of workforce development and education services for opportunity youth and adults. We also provide immigration services for those seeking naturalization. Um, and we serve over 4,000 youth and adults annually across six sites in Brooklyn and Queens. Each year we serve over 600 immigrants through our adult literacy programs. Participants come to class every day after long, multiple or overnight work shifts to build the skills that will allow them to access living wage jobs. Um, our city is home to three million foreign born residents, approximately 49% of which have limited English proficiency. Um, and the city's immigrant population comprises 45% of the city's workforce, and yet despite working at the same or greater rates as native-born New Yorkers, immigrants' mean median earnings are $15,000 lower than native-born residents. Um, and we know that education has always served as a pathway to economic success in our countries, and for immigrants, it is an absolutely vital vehicle to a middle skill job. Um, as a member of NICAL, we join them in calling for the city council and mayor to take two steps towards providing educational opportunity for all. That's restoring and baselining the $12 million. Um, it's, as a provider, we see the consequences of the lack of baselining every day and for each cohort. Um, not having secure funding means that we cannot promise that our teachers will have a job next cohort. And then we have to spend time and resources hiring and training new teachers and we may lose that continuity of education that is so valuable for our students. Um, and then secondly, the city must commit to funding uh, programs at a, a rate that really represents the true cost of doing these programs. Um, 
and we received $928 per participant, and according to um, my colleagues, uh, research, the actual cost is um, over $7,000 per seat. Um, so thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. We are hopeful and grateful for your support um, in this budget negotiation. And I also just want to highlight what Lena said about the importance of adult literacy as more than just a, a workforce development uh, part of a workforce development goal. I think it's so much about being able to participate fully in your community and that's what, that's part of what we really value at OBT um, and with our students like Guillermo. Thank you. Awesome, thank you for that. And, and really the, the only questions I have before we move to the next panel is, is really the, the integration of the mayor's office and their work around census. Have you all met with uh, any of the census folks at the mayor's office? Yeah, so you're talking, is there a line that's open with? Yeah, so uh, UNH, along with being a member of the New York Coalition for Adult Literacy, we're also part of New York Counts 2020. And okay. we've had several conversations with Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson. Great. And we've also been in touch with the recently appointed uh, census person, uh, uh, Julie Menon. Menon. Yeah. And, um, you know, with their leadership, we have been able to secure that $4.3 million, which is excellent. However, like, you said at the very beginning of this hearing, we don't know how that money is going to reach community-based organizations. And yeah, and it's really not. Um, the four point right. three is for the staffing of the office, and and so that's that's the conundrum, that's the problem that we're in right now. And the right. forty million that we're at, we're going to be asking the mayor is going to be the CBO dollars, mm -hmm. and then the forty million from the state that's in this in the assembly and the Senate right now. Hopefully, it comes out in the governor. Part of that will come to the city as well, hopefully for CBO right. injection. So yeah, I'm glad you're talking. And that, that was my, my, my ultimate question about, about that integration, because I think that's going to make the case for baseline stronger. Right. And, and I think we need to really organize that, that conversation uh, as we move through the budget process. Thank you. OK, thank you. Go NICAL. Okay. Uh, next, we have. From the Bronx Defenders, we have a knife up panel here. Zoe Levin, uh, Ellen uh, Pachanda from the Brooklyn Defenders Services, and Hassan um, Sharakia. Um, you're going to have to give me your name again. I'm going to have to say your, your, your last name again, um, Hassan. From Legal Aid, and then Mario Russell from the Catholic Charities, if you can come up. The dream team. <laughs> All right, let's hear, let's let's hear it. Who wants to start? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ellen Patchnanda, and I'm a supervising attorney in the immigration practice at the Brooklyn Defender Services. First of all, I want to thank the City Council Committee on Immigration and Chairman Chaka for this opportunity to testify about the impact of the last year of aggressive immigration enforcement, attacks on due process and immigration court, and the need for increased funding in order to meet the needs of the communities we serve. And I also appreciate having listened to prior testimony and comments from the Council um, your ongoing recognition of knife up, which is the practice I'm in, and our role in fighting for due process for all, and thank you for your continued support. We are here today to ask for increased funding. Specifically, we submitted a joint request for $16.6 .6 million, split evenly across the three providers, to fully fund knife up and fulfill this city's commitment that no family is torn apart by deportation just because they could not afford a lawyer. In my office, Brooklyn Defender Services, we have an immigration practice that has grown and grown in large part thanks to the city's support. We now have 27 attorneys, we have social workers, we have paralegals. We are working consistently at all ends of immigration, speaking about our youth and and communities team, which represents Brooklyn residents in their applications for lawful immigration status and in defending against deportation in the non-detained removal proceedings. Additionally, we have a PDEA team that works to work with our criminal defense attorneys and advise our clients of immigration consequences, and also NIFA, which we work with in representing in the first in the nation 
public defender program that exists representing detained immigrants in removal proceedings starting at Varick Court. We will speak about that fully about what's been happening at Varick Street, but I'd like to highlight now what has been, as this council has recognized, increased ICE enforcement across this city. And I would like to know where this is beginning and where we've seen the largest growth is a 1,700% increase in ICE enforcement and courthouse arrests. And what this does mean, as was discussed earlier today, is that immigrants in our city are being picked up when they have open criminal cases. Oftentimes, these are low-level offenses. Yeah, define open, because this is really important. An open criminal case. Yes. What does that mean to someone that doesn't know anything yes. about courts? Thank you, Chair. What it means is that there is no conviction. It means that that individual has not had the opportunity to defend their case, has not had the opportunity with the due process affords in a criminal court, and how it lends over into immigration court is then that individual, it's the catch-22, if you will, Chair, is that individual is then forced to try to exercise the due process rights in criminal court and remain detained because ICE is not using any of their discretion and they are picking up individuals that just briefly, if I could highlight, they're picking up individuals such as one of our clients who was severely cognitively impaired, suffering from seizures, picked up on the way to an open criminal case, and despite all the efforts to say, come on, just release this individual, we had to go into federal court just to get an immigration judge to give this individual a bond hearing. He suffered prolonged detention because of the decision to pick someone up in the middle of a criminal case, and then the decision to detain that individual, and the decision to detain someone who was that severely ill. And this is continuing, and the numbers alone suggest that it's only going to grow, and it is only with the continued support of this council that we can continue to represent immigrants who really are suffering. And just yesterday, uh, Chair, we had a client who is a young mother, a mother of a five-year-old child, who out of walking out of criminal court in Brooklyn in daylight was taken, seized by ICE officers, and if it weren't for the presence of having, fortunately, this team that could respond and advocate for her, she would be sitting in jail not able to pick up her child from school. That's how important this is. This is a, these are low-level offenses. These are immigrants across this city. And if we're going to stand up for due process for all, we have to increase the funding here so that we can increase the representation and so that no one is missed simply because we refuse to provide this funding. Thank you, thank you for that. And I think this is, the, this is part of the story we need to tell as we go through the budget process. And the one, one question I have, and, and I'll have some questions as we go through the, um, the panel, is the new light of, of uh, the new judges coming through Varick. And, and essentially, we kind of built life up uh, at, this is a council-funded initiative. We built it with that kind of original flow and number of people that could possibly get processed. And so now with video teleconferencing and some other situations like new judges that are appearing this year, this week, um, that's gonna increase. And so I, I wanna hear that throughout, if, there, if, there's, if you can point to that. Um, but that's what's making the need for funding greater so that we have more lawyers, because there's going to be more people in front of judges. These people are, are uh, our New Yorkers are getting picked up on the streets, like you said, the way that they are in broad daylight with open cases, not convictions, and, and they're getting funneled through this deportation machine. And so just thank you for, for laying that out. Good afternoon, Chair, and uh, to the committee. Uh, thank you very much for convening this hearing today and for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Bronx Defenders. Uh, my name is Zoe Levine. I'm the legal director of the immigration practice at the Bronx Defenders, and I'm um, proud to represent uh, my colleagues and my clients who are fighting the deportation machine every day and as we speak. I just want to follow up on some of the things that Ellen has talked about with respect to the knife up program and that you, Chair, have raised um, about our work and what we've seen at the Varick Court. Um, as you've said, we've seen dramatic changes in the way that the immigration court at Varick is functioning. 
and have had serious consequences for our program and which require substantial commitment of resources from the city to address. There's three sort of main areas that I'll address very briefly. Um, we've seen an expansion in the detained court. <coughs> we've seen the change to video technology for the respondents to appear. And we've seen sudden and dramatic shifts in the way that initial appearances are occurring. So starting with the most sort of pressing and immediate concern is the expansion of the immigration of court, which is starting this week. Um, as you mentioned, we've for years had three judges sitting at Varick Street Court, and we have now gone up to five judges who are hearing detained cases at Varick Street. Um, this change was ruled out in a chaotic fashion without transparency to legal providers. Um, we've had a long-standing model of staffing three intake shifts per week, and we've had a universal representation model where we are able to represent all of the respondents, all of the clients that are coming through on those three intake shifts. But now, with the increase to five, we are not able to manage those additional intake shifts. And as we speak, starting today, there are people who are slipping through the cracks. Someone mentioned earlier in one of the panels that the constituent services line, you'll start to hear it ringing, because these families are desperately concerned about their detained relatives, and they want to know, is the city truly providing universal representation? Are they going to get an attorney through knife up? And right now, we don't have an answer for all of those families. Um, we've also seen, as a result of this expansion, that the court is rapidly changing court dates, set and established trial dates, moving them up from uh, expected trial dates that are months away to ones that are merely days or weeks away, which severely impacts our ability to robustly defend these clients. Um, the second point was related to the change to video conferencing. Um, in June of last year, ICE had suddenly and without warning changed its policy of bringing clients to court and changed to a video technology system where our clients watch their proceedings unfold from a jail cell by video. This means that we cannot speak to our clients confidentially before, during, or after their hearings. We've confronted constant technical problems um, due to limited phone lines, difficult with, difficulty with translation, and failing technolog technological systems as extending proceedings by months um, in some cases. Um, both of these um, changes have dramatically affected our ability to maintain our intake model um, and manage the huge influx in enforcement and cases that we see at NIFA. Thank you, and I think what's important here is, I just looked at my opening statement, and I, the way that I introduced the New York, our incredible um, NIFA program I called it a universal representation program. I can't call it that anymore after Monday. It, 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 would be, it would be a lie for us to say we're providing universal representation as of Monday with all these new cases that you're presenting to us. So I think that's, that's, the, that's the point here right now. And I'm, I'm taking that incredibly serious and I'm gonna take this back to our colleagues, the commission or the committee, the speaker, the finance committee, the BNT, that's the, that's the new line. We don't have a universal representation model anymore. And that's the funding question. And that's where we're having a budget hearing. So thank you so much for, for that, that analysis. Hassan? Yes, I'm just going to do that. So good afternoon. My name is Hassan Shafikul. I'm the attorney in charge of the Immigration Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society. I'll be speaking about NIFAP, but a couple other projects as well. And so I'm not gonna reiterate what my colleagues have said, but I'll talk about the federal work that we're doing, all three providers are doing in NIFAP, where we're, our clients who are subject to mandatory detention are languishing in detention. And even though the statute says that they are not entitled to bond, under due process, we've all had successes in getting people out. Even all three providers have had U.S. citizens who were, had no business even being in detention in the first place, and it, if it wasn't for NIFAP, and if it wasn't for going into federal court in some instances to prove it, um, they would have been deported. Just last week, we had an incompetent client who wasn't mentally competent to, to stand trial, um, who was in detention. We managed to get him out um, only by going into federal court. And so um, we're not only in immigration court, but also going into the, into the, um, the federal judiciary to seek relief for our clients. So the, the NIFAP federal work is important, but there's also, and I'm speaking here for, for legal aid, we're doing a lot of work outside of NIFAP in federal courts. Um, 
we just won a class action regarding um, special immigrant juvenile status SIGE um, last week Friday. Um, we're preparing ICE in the courts litigation, challenging the, the abduction of our clients from the courthouses. We're preparing um, public charge litigation. There's various things that, that we're doing. And we're also going into federal court on individual cases, doing petitions for review outside of the NIFAP context. And all of that um, we're seeking support for as well in, in that same written testimony. Um, in the eye care context, um, the providers are asking for an increase up to 3.9 million total as a collaborative. Um, for legal aid, we're asking um, to be fully funded, going up to 822,000 um, to fully fund our current eye care staff. Um, and then the last thing in my time is about IOI, which is not a council initiative, but just a flag for the council that with the expansion of IOI, the city has really um, increased its investment in immigration legal services, which is great. And they did that without an RFP process. And part of that was through subcontracting. Legal Aid currently subcontracts with 23 nonprofits um, in order to. And push let's just walk through that because that's really important. The, essentially, they just they took IOI and then they ex expanded IOI without the RFP. And and what makes that important is that they didn't go through a public process to change the. Mm, help me here. The goals of the of the initiative, the goals of the representation, and so help me. So that that's really important for us to hear about about the step they took, and what they can do to kind of remediate that that step. Right. So I mean, a couple things. So the the goal with IOI is to provide non-detained immigration legal services, and so the city is doing that through this program, but the the process was um, not entirely transparent. Um, and some groups um, were able to come in and others not. Um, legal aid right now is, um, so we were exposed to a lot of liability for our subcontractors, about three and a half million dollars, and so that's a really uncomfortable position for us to be in, just institutionally, both in term fiscally and in terms of performance. Um, so just flagging that. I don't have an ask around that, but just making sure that that's out there. Uh, you mentioned eye care as well, and and essentially we just keep doing it on. We just keep doing what we were doing on eye care. Is there any need that has increased? Yeah. So right now, um, from the council, we're getting about two million as a coalition, and we're asking for an increase of three point nine million. Part of that is to make from the two to three point nine, or three point nine on top of two. Two, two to three point nine million. That's. Uh, um, Increasing to that amount, part of that is to increase. Get his, um, he has testimony. If we can get that, I, said over. I think you mentioned that there, right? Yeah, okay. so that's in there. Um, part of that is to make the d the various programs whole, and part of it is to actually increase capacity for unaccompanied minor children. Got it. Thank you for that. Good afternoon, <laughs> Chairman Chaka. Thank you very much uh, for having me here today. My name is Mario Russell. I'm the Director of Immigrant and Refugee Services for Catholic Charities, um, work we have been doing for over four decades. Um, we've, of course, spoken so much and so often with you and with this council about our work, for which we're grateful for your support, of course. Um, I just want to speak briefly uh, today about a few specific areas of need that Catholic Charities has been working on uh, recently and is really looking to this council for some guidance and support. Um, we have seen and we have heard immigrants and refugees' lives so deeply change and continuing to change, be they longtime residents, undocumented families seeking a way forward, breadwinners who are being arrested and detained and deported, uh, mixed status families who are in crisis, refugees and asylees in need of support and care, men and women and children unaccompanied or accompanied who are seeking to take the first steps towards a safe integration, individuals in court proceedings who have no representation, or simply persons who find themselves in need of appellate and federal representation. We try now to marshal the support and response that they need, and again, thanking you in advance for your support going forward and in the past as well. The, great, the need is great, and we need a response that has your support. I want, for this reason, just to highlight very briefly four areas uh, that complement the conversation we've been having so far, um, and in some cases amplify it a little bit. 
So the four areas that I'd like to bring to your attention, the first is what we call the Immigration Court Help Desk. Um, the Immigration Court Help Desk is a program that's relatively new and is an important one for New York. It is a non-detained deportation counterpart on a modest scale to the screening process that exists with NIFA. <clears throat> and needs, in our opinion, expanded support and coverage. It was created to assist immigrants in removal proceedings in order for them to understand their rights and learning, uh, teaching them to navigate the immigration system a little bit more effectively. At the New York Immigration Court today, Catholic Charities provides immigrants who are facing removal with a few things, information about the immigration court process, how to access and utilize available resources, and of course, referrals to competent representation. The principal purpose of the Immigration Court Help Desk is to give immigrants support, information, and guidance. Since 2016, August, when it was begun, over 2,500 immigrants who are facing removal have received this kind of assistance. Um, many, also importantly, off, we have given pro se assistance in filing over 600 cases that would, in this case, allow them to meet a statutory deadline. We currently offer 10 days of this presence at the immigration court, and we think it's important to be able to double that presence. Can I ask you a question about that? Sure. Uh, you're asking for about $200,000 from the council or from somebody? It's probably going to have to be the council. Somebody. Um, <laughs> just the way things are going. I check my mind. Um, but uh, or I should say, and the current funding to to the Immigration Court Help Desk, where is that coming from? How it's are Department you? Department of Justice. Department of Justice. Right. Got it. So this would be in addition to the Department of Justice Correct. funding Correct. to amplify from your current 10 days across the board. That's correct. And you're working in conjunction. From 10 to about 16 or 20 days. 16 to 20 days. Right. Got it. I see it here. Okay. And then you're working in conjunction with, with Knife Up. And you're in, you're integrated in that, or I mean, it's it's connected, right? It serves slightly different populations because this is a non-detained. Well, this is not detained, right? Right. Got Correct. It. Okay. Um, but what what's important about this is that the judges like this program and therefore still receive the support of the DOJ because it helps them on an efficiency side. Right. Um, and obviously, well, that's what they say about knife up too, which is great. I, though I'm I'm not sure if they say it now. I don't know. <laughs> we should ask them. When we the see argument next. changes with the month, but I think we're still in the zone for the moment. Um, <laughs> but I think it's a really important program, particularly because a lot of immigrants, right, are re referred there by the judges. Mm -hmm. um, if that did not happen, they might also miss the opportunity to enter the IOI support or the MOYA support, whatever other structures exist in the city networked, including pro bono, of course. Right. Um, and so walk me through the other pieces really sure, quick. I'll be very brief. Um, what we're also proposing is an appellate and federal litigation representation program. Really, again, the bottom line here is, and again, my colleagues here all do it probably ad hoc, right, as needed, but there needs to be a systematic attention given to the need for representation at the BIA levels, and then what happens after that. It is a reality we're facing with 103,000 or more cases pending in the immigration courts. Those and many cases will end up before the BIA, and I think presenting well-structured, well-thought-out, well-reasoned, dignified cases is going to make the difference, perhaps in a short-term strategy and more hopefully with a long-term strategy where um, changes come, especially given that the laws, <clears throat> or at least to the extent that, that the Attorney General has attempted to write restrict interpretation of domestic violence eligibility or gang violence eligibility or other areas where we really need to maintain what, what those standards are under statutory law, and if not international law. And I think this is where we bring that forward. A third area, and it, in a sense it's a reiteration also here, is what we would call our emergency action and enforcement response. I'll be blunt, about seven or eight months ago, I, I got a call from Sister Elizabeth in the Bronx, who said that the next day, Natalio P. was gonna check in on his own. And he wanted to do it because um, he didn't want ICE coming to his house. He has seven U.S. citizen children under the age of 15, one with Down syndrome, another with other medical disabilities, and an undocumented wife. Classic case. What do we do? Of course, we went with him the next morning, but in a sense, it was a losing battle. Right? There's a zero-tolerance policy effect in effect with ICE. He was brought to New Jersey, and we've been honestly So he was taken while in, during his check-in that, seven months exactly ago. That's exactly what happened yeah. the next morning at 8 o'clock you know, in Bergen County. Um, you know, and 
But again, the value of Sister Elizabeth's call at least allowed us to enter the scene. Now, ideally, what we would propose is, can we catch, so to speak, people who have ICE check-ins well before? So you can marshal arguments, you can prepare, you can design a strategy, but even this alone, yesterday he was released, right? Why? Well, we did a habeas corpus there, we tried in the Southern District, um, bond hearing. So one thing led to the next. Again, significant resources expended. We're all to some extent having to learn this on the fly, but I would submit this is an incredibly deep and important area. And I would say that when we talk about family separation, and we all navigated the summer's family separation crisis, this is a hidden family separation crisis of a much larger magnitude. Well, it's well, known, it's well known to us in New York, and I think that's where we need to keep hem hammering the, the conversation around, that family separation isn't just happening is at it? the border, it's right. happening here. And the strategy is, council member, I would say, you know, it's clear, detain the breadwinner and see if you can engage in a war of attrition with the family. That's yeah, what it is. That's the battle. That's, that's the battle strategy of this administration. No so doubt. I know my time is up, I'll respectfully end here, but of course the last item I would draw to draw your attention to is really the need for support and case management, job development assistance to asylum seekers. Yep. Um, it's an area we've talked that. about before. We have a plan that we can share and bring forward, but the notion of bringing that integrative support to people who are in this pending status now for five, six years at this point, um, I think is really critical to the health of <coughs> those individuals, their families, and to some extent, of course, our own society. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. And, and I think that, that the, the ultimate question here is if we want universal representation on the detained and a detained docket, detained population, and non-detained, but really we're looking at removals as a whole for these two populations, the question I have for you all and really for the whole room is what is that, what is that gonna cost? What are we talking about here? And so I'm hoping you can work with us to really develop that uh, as a whole because these are all different components of the larger strategy as we build our machine against the deportation machine, our machine based out of love and compassion and family unity. And, and so that, I think that's, the, that's the, the kind of main takeaway right now is this, is this is real, it's happening now. It's been happening for months already, but now, now it's our turn as a city in this budget process to name it and then fund it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have Howard uh, Shi, Asian American Federation, uh, Maya Gurung, Adhikar, uh, Suring Lama from Adhikar, the Chinese Progressive Association, Mei Li, uh, the Union Community Health Center, Coalition Against Smoking and Immigrant Communities, uh, Dr. Vanessa Salcedo, and Naomi Feldman, the Charles B. Wang Community Health Center in Coalition Against Smoking and Immigrant Communities. I think we have another chair coming. There we go. Everyone should have their chair. Okay, who would like to start? So I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Chaka and the Committee for Immigration for the support um, of immigrants across the city. Um, and we also want to thank you for uh, your support for our, our work. Um, because of your support, we've been able to do a lot of advocacy for uh, immigrants, so we've been able to advocate for um, uh, food delivery workers around the e-bike issue with the Little River Justice Coalition. We've been able to push through language access, uh, expand the number of languages that are covered a couple of years ago. And, you know, we've been in discussion about how we can look for innovative ways to fully implement that 
that promise. Uh, and also, um, we were able to hold uh, media advisories and media briefings with ethnic media about the public charge as well. So all of your support is really important in making sure Asian Americans are part of the conversation around immigration. Um, but I'd like to uh, highlight in, um, that's uh, in our written testimony um, is the fact that you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, one of the things I want to highlight is that um, one of the challenges in the Asian community is connecting the, uh, our immigrant communities with the uh, immense investments that the city and state has made in legal, immigrant legal services. Um, a lot of the times there is a gap between where the services are and where our communities are living. And so through LDP, we've been able to show um, how connecting and funding community-based organizations, they've been able to connect those people to the resources that they need, to the immigrant legal services. So we were able to, through that program, meet and exceed all of the program deliverable goals. And it just demonstrates the tremendous demand for those services and the need to be able to provide those services through our member agencies and through the uh, CDOs. Um, so one of the challenges is that the LDP is not a baseline fund from the state, and so we're facing challenges in sort of maintaining the capacity and the gains that we've made in the community. And so we're looking for opportunities for the, either the council or we're also pushing with the state to continue funding our groups to do the work that they've shown that they can do. Um, secondly, I wanted to talk about uh, Asian business owners. They are really drivers of both economic growth in the city. Uh, a report we did a couple years ago showed that half of the net new jobs created and half of net new economic activity were due to Asian-owned businesses in the city. Um, obviously, it ties to you know, all the, the workers in our community. They're looking for jobs that they can um, have a foothold in, in, um, in you know, working and emerging into our workplace. Um, and so Asian-owned businesses are providing that. And but what we're seeing through our work in Flushing through an EDC contract is that there's a gap, again, within um, the services that the city offers and in, invests in small businesses and the ability for the um, small business owners in the Asian community to access those. For example, if there's a tremendous number of businesses in Flushing, but the closest small business assistance centers are in uh, Jackson Heights and Astoria, and you know, given transit, it's a, it's a big challenge. And so, we want to be able to create programs where we can bring those services to the community, modeled on our experiences in Flushing. And we're looking to talk with you about expanding those to other neighborhoods as well. And finally, um, you know, Census 2020 goes without saying. I think there's been some um, uh, work done at the national level that showed that Asian Americans. Uh, compared to other groups are less likely to be trustful of the census, largely because of the census question and the immigration debate. And we're looking, we, we're really encouraged by the, the request that you're making for the city to provide money for CBOs, and I think it's really important that trusted voices are sending out the same message um, about the safety million. and the importance. Yeah, so. If we need more, let we, me know, but yeah. I, th I think that's, yeah, the, it, it, that's it's the number. A, it's a great start, and we'd, we'd love to be part of that conversation about how um, we, um, build the coalitions and get um, the Asian CBOs involved in that as well. So thank you. And the one thing I'm going to say to that point, because the New York Immigration Coalition is doing a, doing a good job of pulling, all, pu pulling it all together, right. but the message is pretty clear. Build your plan for your capacity and how, how much you can do. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's where we start. We have to start with you. We can't force this on you. Really build the plan. And then, and then we can plug in that way, and uh, yeah, and that's going to change yeah. from organization to organization, uh, as far as the capacity. Right. I think a lot of Asian organizations are part of the New York Counts 2020, and we've been contributing to that that process where right. FPI did that study and they requested information from all member agencies, and so yeah. it's kind of already in there. So yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm hearing great things about it too, uh, and our job is to bring the bring the money. And Thank we're gonna you. we're gonna do everything to make that happen. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Mei Li. I'm the executive director of the Chinese Progressive Association, and I wanted to thank you, Chairman Taka, and the rest of the committee for always playing such a leadership role in um, you know trying to get our communities more funding, but more importantly, advocate for. Um, you know, uh, on important issues. Um, the last time I was here, I think it was the, the meeting about public charge. Um, so I, so I'm from Chinatown on the Lower East Side, and it's a rapidly 
gentrifying community, but there's still an, a significant undocumented population and a significant low income population. Um, for us, our families um, live at about 100, a little over the poverty level. So, if, for example, a family of three might make uh, twenty-five to twenty-seven thousand dollars, and I think that's 150 percent of federal poverty level. Um, we, uh, and also the other situation is that there are a lot of uh, families in doubled-up housing. So, um, and you know, it, it could be in the regular private housing, like the tenements, or the or the public housing. Uh, so I know there's a lot talked about um, in terms of legal services, and we're part of the Asian American Federation Liberty Defense Fund project. And um, uh, there's also a need for legal services that are located directly in the community and the CBOs, and even in a place like Chinatown. Uh, we um, recently have had the experience of um, you know trying to you know we provide some simple legal services, but sometimes we have to bring them to the nonprofit providers. And even though the nonprofit provider might be downtown as well, and maybe just in City Hall somewhere or down in the financial district, it's not that far from Chinatown, but it was an ordeal to get them there. I mean, it was a real ordeal. And we're talking about undocumented immigrants who are not that connected to everything. Uh, for us, you know, some of our immigrants, they work, uh, you know, they, they, um, they, they work in other places because they can't find jobs here. So, you know, they take the bus to, you know, the casinos or the restaurants in Albany and they work and they travel back and forth like that. You know, so it's, uh, it's like sort of like being a migrant worker, you know, but, but you work in the restaurant or the casinos. Uh, so that's the type of population I'm talking about, the difficult to reach population that we um, still really need to take care of. So the other thing is about the census. Um, I wanted to set, let you know that we also think the census is really important, and it's important to our community to, that's um, rapidly gentrifying. So we have, because you know, the rising um, cost of housing, we have a wealthier population that's moving in, and it, makes, it skews the numbers for our community. So we still have our low-income families in the doubled-up housing, who are less likely to answer census, and then we have this higher income population. So then when you, even if you drill down to the community district, it looks good when you average it out. But actually our community, the community district that Chinatown is in is the one with the, high, the second highest income disparity in the whole city. Uh, so we um, really like to say we, yeah, we really need that. You know, our, our organization has been, has in some way participated in the last three censuses. So we, um, you know, have some experience and we have a plan, but in order to do the outreach that we need to do this time around, especially with the citizenship question and the um, first time where the internet is the um, primary way to answer the census, you know, we need also some resources and funding. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Chairman Menchaca, um, for this opportunity to, to present testimony today in front of the Committee on Immigration. Um, my name's Naomi Feldman. I'm the Director of Research and Evaluation at the Charles B. Wong Community Health Center. We are a federally qualified health center with sites uh, located in Manhattan and Queens. Um, and last year, we served over 60,000 unique patients for more than 300,000 patient encounters. 83% uh, of our patients are at or below 200% of the federal poverty level, and 82% are actually best served in a language other than English. So I first wanted to take this opportunity to thank you and the committee for your ongoing support and funding of our health center's health education and immigration um, related outreach community, uh, outreach activities with communities located in Flushing, Queens. Um, we've had great success with this program and we hope to expand our outreach in the future. Um, this is through the Immigrant Health Initiative. Um, but with all that said, I'm actually here today to testify on behalf of the Coalition Against Smoking and Immigrant Communities. This is a coalition that's comprised of community-based health and social service organizations seeking discretionary funds to support a citywide expansion of the Tobacco Use Navigator Model Program. So we've all joined together in an effort to reduce smoking disparities in foreign-born, limited English proficient populations. This model provides lay, community-based health workers the skills to educate and connect smokers to culturally competent smoking cessation resources. Uh, recent data on, sm on immigrant smoking, though sparse, 
highlights tobacco use among uh, certain subgroups. And while we've seen smoking rates go down for New York City as a whole over the past uh, 15 plus years, um, we've seen, for example, smoking um, among Asian American men has actually increased from 19.6% to 23.5% between 2002 and 2016. So what we're actually seeing is, is rates going in the opposite direction. Furthermore, 28% of foreign-born non-citizens in New York City do not have uh, health insurance, decreasing their likelihood to be connected to preventative care and education. So as an organization, we're requesting $100,000 for our tobacco use navigators to identify and connect approximately 200 smokers to smoking cessation treatment that will provide them with free long-term counseling and free nicotine replacement therapy. And you can sort of juxtapose that to the cost of actually treating someone who might be diagnosed, let's say, with lung cancer um, as a result of smoking. Um, a study done uh, almost 15 years ago showed that it cost $45,000 for initial treatment for, for lung cancer and over $120,000 if, if, if that first level of treatment actually fails. So from a cost-effective basis, something like providing community-based smoking cessation navigation resources can be really, really effective. And, and I'm joined here by a bunch of our colleagues today who will speak more to, to, to this issue. So thank you. I have one question on the DOH-MH relationship. Do you get any funding for this initiative from uh, from DOHMH? We don't receive any funding for this initiative. There is, this, is the, this is a new initiative. It, because there's, a, there's, a, there's a hepatitis work, there's a lot of other things that we're doing. So this is, just if I'm hearing it correctly, a new initiative uh, built out of this coalition. We have one member in our coalition who received funding through the Immigrant Health Initiative that's supported by your committee last year, that's Korean Community Services, and they'll speak a little bit more about their work doing that. Okay. Um, for all of the other partners in the coalition, this is, this is unfunded work for us. So um, some of us are already do, trying to do this work, but are hoping for support from the city, and others um, have sort of the groundwork or the, the the foundation to be able to do it, but um, in order to really ramp this up, they would need support. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Vanessa Salcedo, and I am a pediatrician and director <coughs> of health promotion at Union Community Health Center, which is a federally, federally qualified health center in the Bronx. And just to give you a little background, um, Union comprises of six sites, and we have a modal, mobile medical unit that serves all of the Bronx. Last year, we served 40,000 unique patients, generating over 180,000 uh, patient visits. And um, Union is excited to join the coalition of against smoking and immigrant communities, uh, like Noomin was saying. And this is the first time that we're part of this coalition, but as um, she was mentioning that we have the groundwork, we have um, navigators, but not specifically targeted at tobacco use and smoking. So um, Union is asking for discretionary funding to implement this uh, tobacco use navigator model that is effective, that is effective in this community health center. And we're specifically targeted foreign-born Spanish-speaking patients, um, and we will train a navigator to educate and provide these evidence-based smoking sensation resources. Um, as you may know, uh, Latinos are the second largest immigrant group that smoke in New, New York City. Um, and what's interesting is that Latino smokers are likely to attempt to quit, but less likely to receive counseling and medication. So that's why this is very important pro work that we would like to do. In addition to, as a pediatrician, it's really important to also address the public health crisis of e-cigarettes among teenagers, particularly among our immigrant youth. Um, as you might know about this, this crisis going on with vaping, um, adolescents, uh, in high schools have increased by 78% in high schoolers say that they have vaped in the last year and 48 middle schoolers 
40%, excuse me, there's been an increase of 48% in middle schoolers over the last year. So this is alarming rates and we're not doing anything about it. So we wanna work with the schools that we have partnerships in educating the students because it does affect their brain development and they think it's safe and cool. So these are the things that we would like to do and we're excited to be part of the coalition. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Salcedo. A young, a young person came to our office and said he wanted to organize his young people in his school about vaping. He's seen everybody carrying these sticks that can get USB charged and mm -hmm. it's just like this cool factor. And, and anyway, where's Sochi? My chief of staff. Anyway, we're, we're trying to do something. So I'm, I'm excited that, that there's a lot of conversation and it's being led by young people. They're saying to themselves, this is not okay. We know this is not good, but it's infiltrated uh, culture in our middle schools, middle school kids are, because they think it's, well, anyway, you just said everything, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Adi Carr. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you to Chair Mancheka and the committee uh, and immigration for convening this hearing. Uh, my name is Maya Gurum and my name is Sering. And we are from Adikar. Uh, Adhikar is the only woman-led worker and community center serving and organizing the Nepali-speaking community on workers' rights, immigrant rights, access to health care, and language justice issue. Uh, the majority of our work, uh, members are uh, low-wage workers. Uh, in 2018, with limited resources for our service work, we managed over 100 cases for members or in, on immigration and worker rights. We also organized 13 TPS re-registration clinics in New York alone, uh, legal screening for adjustment of status, as well as uh, four Know Your Rights training for nearly 2,000 Nepali TPS holders and immigrants in the city in partnership with <coughs> legal service providers such as Legal Aid Society, Urban Justice Center, and City Bar Justice Center. Mm, one challenge we face is that we do not have an immigration attorney housed within the organization uh, to assist mem uh, members with specific uh, le uh, immigration related inquiries and consultation. To give you an idea of uh, the need, we get anywhere between eight to 10 calls uh, or walk-ins with immigration questions or needs a day. Uh, without an in-house attorney, uh, we must depend on other legal service providers for any kind of immigration related support. Uh, we refer our members out to city agencies such as Action NYC. However, uh, our members have not been able to access uh, their services due to the initial uh, language barrier and members get uh, discouraged uh, to go to the agency and sometimes never return to Can I office. ask, is that something that you've, do you've documented before to Action NYC providers, yes. the, the language barrier? Is that something that's documented? in a like letter or in some kind of formal way? Not a letter. So let's work on doing that because I think that's really important and that can help uh, help us shift um, not just resources but attention to, to this. This is, this is really alarming and, but not surprising. And so we need, we need to just put it all on paper. That's, that's how we do what we've got to do. Put it on paper and then I want to help support that with my own letter and saying please respond. Action NYC, Moya, to this issue, fix it on paper. Sorry, keep going. Keep, well, tell me more about what else. Uh, what what else is 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 part part of your work here um, that's associated with funding and requests for funding. Um, so so the next thing is around like English classes, the adult literacy piece. Uh, we do uh, we do five English classes and a citizenship class every week. Um, we don't get any funding for it. Um, and we have around like 200 plus members who attend the classes right now. Um, and I think the main point is like for a lot of the work that we have to do, it is done based on the needs of the community and it's not direct funding that we get. Um, so what we're asking for is, is to expand the capacity uh, to, to kind of uh, fund uh, uh, um, community organizations like Adhikar directly um, and not by funding like small five, thousand to a ten thousand like discretionary funds that are available but to fund like more uh, um, by giving us like about like hundred thousand dollars a year grants that are committed to about three years um, so that that can expand our capacity so um, yeah that's what we're asking for 
Thank you. And, and I guess the one question I have too about the lawyer, uh, you, you don't have a lawyer and so you're really relying on um, referrals. Right. And how, how I know that you're, you're trying to get a lawyer, but um, how, how are the referrals working? Do, do they work? Is that something that, that you felt like the other, because I'm assuming, well, tell me how a referral system works, because this is really important in, in, in connecting you to the day laborers worker uh, in, initiative and those organizations, they're doing that too. And sometimes some of them have lawyers, some of them don't, and, but they're referring. And so the power of referrals is that you're, you're sometimes seeing people who have, the first time that they reach out to anyone is you for services of some kind. And then you don't have the lawyer, but then you refer them. And does that work? Is that working for you? <laughs> yeah, so the, the referral system works, but because we saw the legal services with them to their limited capacity as well. So a lot of times they won't be able to take a lot of cases as well, so that's another issue. But even within the referral system, we always have to be there uh, as interpreters, as, as support for able to even navigate the referral system. So that's why there's, as a staff, there's just a lot of uh, um, 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 capacity-wise, we're like really stretched. I mean, it does work. We have like, we work with Legal Aid, we work with uh, Urban Justice Center, we work with City Bar. So these are all the organizations which we work with, but with two staff, uh, there's just, <laughs> like we've done 100 last year, so there's not much we can do in terms of referrals sometimes. Thank you, and that's an important part about building capacity within our organizations, and if this funding for, not if, when this funding comes out from the census, like we're gonna need you to be part of this and you need to be ready, and the part of that is a capacity component as well so that you can you can expand your services and and have all, all, all the stuff that you need on the ground. So thanks for, for sharing that with us. We're gonna have to figure out how how to do that uh, and, and help you build that capacity. Even with a lawyer on, on board, there's gonna be a lot more stuff that you're gonna need and, and uh, thank you for that. Thank you to the panel. Thank you for coming today. Next panel, uh, I think we have three more panels uh, to go. From New York Lawyers for Public Interest, Laura Redman, Safe Passage Project, Rich uh, Limesider, Jody Zeissmer from NILAG, uh, Heather Axford, Central American Legal Assistance, Gregory Copeland, um, NSC Community Legal Defense, and Sarah Gilman from the NSC Community Legal Defense. It's a big panel, but it's a big conversation. Can we start here to my to my left? Let's let's pull this. You want to? Can you start? Thank you make sure that the, the button is red, and it's close to you. Yes. Hi. There you go. Oh, it's better. Thank you. Um, my name is Jody Ziesmer. I am the Director of the Immigrant Protection Unit at the New York Legal Assistance Group, or NILAG. Um, I want to talk to you today about uh, flexible sp funding for immigrant legal services and advocacy to respond to changes in policies and practice. So over the past year, we've seen quickly changing policies and increasing enforcement and confusion as lawsuits halt or temporarily roll back some of the harshest policies and unlawful interpretations of the statute. For example, and as you've heard today, we witnessed the enactment of the zero tolerance policy, which resulted in forced separation of parents and children at the border, a 1,700% increase in ICE apprehensions at New York courts, and a temporary extension of both DACA and TPS stemming from lawsuits filed against the administration's attempt to end both programs. In addition, uh, changes to the government's interpretation of public charge, both intended and executed, have given rise to fears and questions in the immigrant communities when it comes to the receipt of public benefits and require the need for education and counsel. Just this past week, federal courts clarified that children over 18 are eligible to apply for special immigrant juvenile status, requiring NILAG and our partners to reach back out to communities to ensure that children, particularly those who are close to 21, are aware of this change and can apply for these benefits um, 
and we're also going to be doing a lot of education in these both for the communities and for providers regarding this um, really favorable decision. There will be additional unpredictable and urgent issues that will require flexible emergency response. Um, NILAG requests that the Cindy expand its current programs that provide flexible funding and provide additional funding that is not tied to, to deliverables. There certainly is a need for uh, response and representation uh, for people in removal proceedings, but there is also a large number of people that already have removal orders or are in some sort of limbo that need a rapid response that doesn't necessarily fall into the city's deliverables in terms of representation and we would request uh, flexible funding in order to meet that need and to anticipate a lot of the other changes that are likely to come in the next year or two years. Um, in addition to things like Know Your Rights presentations and education um, and doing uh, cooperating with city council members and other elected officials to really outreach into the communities and make sure that they are aware of their rights and that they're educated about the changes in the law. Thank you for that. And, and, and I, I guess as we move through the panel, uh, some of you have prov provided us written testimony and we're gonna go through all of it and, and kind of comb through it. What I wanna say, what I wanna hear is uh, what I think has been the theme here around prioritization of, of, of the limited funding. And what I'm convinced more and more that removals are where, where we need to be pa placing a lot of thought because re removals are connected to the separation of our families on our ground. We heard from the economic development, or sorry, the economic panels, the economic justice panels. Um, our immigrants are the backbone of our city. And so that's, we need to make the case, and so I'm hoping you can help us make the case for this. I would just encourage you not to lose sight of the people that already have removal orders. There's literally thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably of people in the New York City that have removal orders already, and when those people are picked up, there's such an urgency, yeah. both in the community and for that particular individual, to have a rapid legal response. Right. And that is currently not funded through any program. And requires That's what I'm saying. So I guess you said what I was trying to say, which is that's that's the that's the scope that is not our current scope. Yes. We don't have a universal representation. I'm just realizing now we don't have universal representation anymore um, because of the courts and how they're shifting. And so, how do we move the scope to the true cause and need of the crisis that we're in right now? And so, what you're talking about is what I'm learning. I think right now, post order removals. And so that doesn't, that's not part of our knife up program because those are people who are in detention. Yeah. What you're talking about are folks that are enjoying their life right now, working and maybe showing up to an ICE. So that's what I'm, I, that's, help us make that case. You're, 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 in, you're in the mix of it. And that's what we're gonna need to be able to talk to our council members, the mayor, the speaker, everyone else. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Laura Redmond. I'm the director of the health justice program at the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, and I'm here in support of the Immigrant Health Initiative. Um, as you said, you have our written testimony, so I guess I'll just kind of summarize very quickly the work that we do that is related to what you're talking about here in terms of the NIFA program, in terms of um, people in detention and such. We have a medical legal community partnership where we um, provide advocacy, connection to medical providers, um, litigation, lots of things in relation to focusing on health care access and immigration detention, getting people better care, getting people out, and helping in underlying immigration cases. And why I think it's just an important thing to flag in the question that you've asked is that health is really a catalyst and a great way of demonstrating the horrors of our immigration detention um, machine, as you called it appropriately. Um, the lack of health care, the healthy people that go in and unhealthy people that go out. Um, and we really hope that health can be both by using the power of doctors, the powers of lawyers, and the powers of community together can really show how health can be a catalyst to really um, un upend this system. But in order to do that, we need the lawyers. Um, we work very closely with the Knife Up program and with other attorneys doing this work. And um, we all rely on each other um, to do this advocacy. So, you know, I 
Grace here has stories to tell you of people that we've helped get released, people who get better care in the community than they ever do in detention. And um, you're talking about detention, so these are yeah. your, so, so we the were, stories that we'll see are, are people who were in, that went into detention healthy, left unhealthy, and for a long exper extended period of time. Yes, the majority of people we see are there from six months to a year, and that's increasing. Um, but I do want to just also flag the other piece of work that we do that's funded under the Immigrant Health Initiative, which is focused on um, connecting undocumented and uninsured immigrants with serious health conditions to state-funded Medicaid. So we do outreach, education, immigration representation, health care advocacy for people with serious life-threatening illnesses to connect them to state-funded Medicaid and, and life-saving care. And although we are um, encouraged and, and happy about the, the city and the mayor's new program. Um, we still have questions about whether it covers the extreme specialist care that our clients need and that Medicaid provides. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's caring for the whole person, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Menchaca. I'm gonna just read a selection of our submitted testimony and uh, we can talk about uh, lots more. So thank you for convening this hearing, for inviting the public to speak. My name is Rich Limesider. I'm the Executive Director of Safe Passage Project, a nonprofit legal services organization that provides free lawyers as of this afternoon to 873 child refugees who are currently being deported. We serve children who live in the five boroughs of New York City and in the two counties of Long Island. Safe Passage receives vital support from the City Council through the Unaccompanied Minor Initiative as a part of the I Care Coalition. And this year, we're also requesting $65,000 in speaker discretionary funds to address legal needs that arose uh, particularly from the recent government shutdown. No immigrant, not even a child, is appointed a lawyer in immigration court. This is uh, what we all know. If a child can't afford to hire an attorney, they are forced to defend themselves alone against a trained government prosecutor. And as we also have spoken about, children without a lawyer win their cases only 17% of the time, but with a lawyer, they win 85% of the time. And that's part of a 15-year ongoing study from TRAC. The recent 35-day government shutdown created new challenges for our work. Cases will now take even longer to resolve. For example, cases that were set for a final asylum trial at immigration court during the shutdown will be rescheduled perhaps as late as 2022. We're not quite sure yet. Documents that were required to be filed during the shutdown are now in a black hole. Uh, in total, Safe Passage Project had over a dozen hearings that were postponed and uh, an asylum trial that didn't go forward. Delays are dangerous for our clients, work intensive for our staff. While we wait, we have to maintain contact with the client, file work permit renewals, help them enroll in health insurance, file paperwork every time they move, the list goes on. To say nothing of the emotional trauma that this period of waiting causes for a young child who should already be on the path to citizenship. And if the delay puts their case at risk and, they f and it forces deportation, then their life may be in danger. Safe Passage is also a proud member of iCare, which, as you know, was created hand-in-hand -hand with the Council as part of a public-private partnership, and we are proud to be a part of the group, including The Door, Legal Aid, Kala, Catholic Charities, Kind, many of the incredible folks that are sitting at this table with me, um, and the City Council as a national leader in access to council work for immigrants, and you have been, and we appreciate that, committed to funding our coalition with matching funding from the Robin Hood Foundation. And I, and I do want to say that Robin Hood has already committed a million dollars of its own private funding toward our overall eye care budget for FY20. Um, and so to date, eye care has represented almost 2,000 children. And we are, uh, as you've heard before, requesting $3.9 million to fully, <coughs> fund, uh, to fully fund the coalition, not only the cases that we've uh, already taken and are supporting, but to add 400 new uh, I care clients over the course of FY20. You know, one additional challenge I want to mention is that the present structure of some city funding doesn't match the reality of these children's cases, and to echo what Jody and others have said, so current contracts limit both the amount of legal work that we're allowed to get reimbursed for for any particular child, as well as the number of kids that we can re-enroll in any subsequent fiscal year, and we'd love to work together with the council uh, to help our partners at HRA and the Office of Civil Justice to make sure those, those contracts are flexible to allow for that work. Um, we're very concerned about the effects of these challenges, especially on children, but I am deeply encouraged by the City Council's continued support, and I look forward to the day when we can all live up to our shared vision that no child should face the immigration process alone. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to help, Rich, the, the work with the HRA uh, and the Office of Civil Justice Let's figure out how we can 
it just sounds like pe the right people need to sit in a room and figure it out. So you have our support. Let's follow up immediately on that. And then the only other thing on, on just the budget, the budget requests, the 65,000 for discretionary funds that arose from the shutdown, that you're kind of calculating on a separate track, separate from the increase to the 3.9 million? Yes. Okay. Um, and then Robin Hood has pledged again for another million. Yes. Uh, can we get them up a little bit more to match our 3.9? Uh, not only can they not go further, but they've indicated that this may be their last year. Mm. That they see things as pilot programs. They are very yeah. excited of the role they played in housing right to council, and they're ready to think about other priorities, and they're hoping that this would be mainstreamed, uh, baselined uh, sooner than later. I agree. I agree. Okay. Thank you for that. Hi, Heather Axford from Central American Legal Assistance. Um, we've been representing asylum seekers in removal proceedings since 1986. Last year, we were in immigration court over 500 times. Um, we represent folks from the trial level up to federal court when necessary. Um, over the past few years, we have found managing our caseload and deploying staff to become really difficult. Um, on one hand, cases have become much more labor intensive. Uh, there was a lot of publicity around the Attorney General's decision gutting asylum protections for victims of domestic violence. Um, less publicized, but equally insidious, was his decision to end U um, immigration court's authority to administratively close cases. Basically, prosecutorial discretion doesn't exist in immigration court anymore, and we have to fully litigate every single case on our docket. Um, in November, we had a, uh, a man who was detained at his home days after his hearing in which the immigration judge had indicated her, uh, her intention to grant asylum. He was detained for no reason. We had to go into federal court to get him out. Um, he was granted asylum last week. They continue to hold his employment authorization document. Every case is just a battle. Um, on the other hand, docking, docket scheduling has become really chaotic. On one hand, we have cases um, where the immigration judge retired or was transferred in 2017, and they still haven't been reassigned. Um, but they won't tell us until the week of the hearing that the hearing's not going forward. So we're fully preparing hearings only to have them not go forward, which is a waste of resources for us, and it's traumatizing for our clients. On the other hand, we are getting cases advanced with no notice to us, you know, maybe a week's notice, a month's notice, um, and, you know, in, in, in the fall, EOIR um, prioritized what they called FAMU, family unity cases, um, basically expediting cases of families who'd been uh, caught at the, at the southern border, and, and they instructed immigration judges that they had to adjudicate these cases within a year of arrival. But CALA, going into 2019, we already had 185 asylum trials scheduled, cases that had been scheduled since 2016. So our capacity to take on these new merits hearings in 2019 is really limited. Um, and the judges are just not given the flexibility that they need to work with us. Um, so this has all been really difficult for us. Um, we continue to show up for our clients for due process. Since the court reopened at the end of January, we had, um, we've had 25 asylum trials go forward. We've won permanent protection for 34 people. Um, our youngest client is three years old. We actually co-counseled with our eye care partner, Safe Passage. Uh, she was four months when she fled with her mother. Her mom was a cooperating witness against members of the Mara Salvatrucha that had murdered her uncle. Um, she has two older brothers, eight and 10, um, who are now gonna be coming up on a plane with visas. Uh, because their mom won asylum and a right to reunify. So we're really grateful to you guys. We get support through eye care, which provides the targeted funding for these families. Also IR, IOI funding, which is um, more general and allows us to, for instance, we've seen a huge uptick in Venezuelan asylum seekers, which are usually single adults. IOI funding has helped us pivot to assist this new population. We're really <coughs> grateful to you guys in kind of helping us to help them because they deserve it. The only thing that I want to, I want to point to here is like this. You're describing the machine, the deportation, deportation machine, and how savvy it's become to destabilize the support that we've been focused on as a city through partnerships with all of you, and the funding from taxpayer funding. 
and so this is what's at stake here. So thank you for just giving us more more context and struct and texture about what's happening uh, in in real time. So thank you, Gregory. Uh, thank you to the committee and thank you, Chairman Menchaca, for allowing us to be here today. Um, Sarah and I are part of a, Sarah Gilman and I are part of a, a new organization, NSC Community Legal Defense. Um, we were previously at the Legal Aid Society and we started uh, this new organization in partnership with the New Sanctuary Coalition, um, seeking to meet um, a gap that we, we, we thought we saw within the universal representation model. Um, you know, as you've identified, there's, um, the changes that we've seen this week in, in the immigration courts um, sort of decimate the ability to call the model uh, a universal representation model. But even before that, um, you know, the number of people with post orders or that are ineligible for, for knife up services, whether it's because um, they, you know, desperately paid, uh, paid a private attorney that they can no longer afford to pay, you know, to fully litigate their case or for whatever reason, there's a, a, an enormous population of New Yorkers um, that are, are not served by the, the, <coughs> the legal service um, scheme that's in, in place. Um, our model is, is, is um, primarily a rapid response model that we, we developed at the Legal Aid Society um, somewhat successfully to um, um, get into federal court, prevent deportations um, that were you know, imminent. Um, some of these have been, we've, we, filed, we filed a case on February 25th for, uh, at 5 p.m. for somebody that was to be deported at 8.20 and argued it at 7.30 and got a stay at 7.50. So these are, these are you know, uh, very emergent situations that given our, the experience that we've, we've now developed over the course of about 18 months trying these cases, um, we you know, are, are in a position to, to stop that deportation and then actually you know, partner with other organizations and uh, build capacity and, and, and fight these cases. Um, you know, the, the first of our, uh, of our uh, rapid response cases um, was brought by Sarah in March of, uh, in March of 2018. And um, yesterday we were in immigration court and um, the judge made a point of, uh, of um, having the DHS attorney recognize that this person was a US citizen. Um, she was uh, about to be put on a plane with incredibly complex um, you know, medical issues and you know, whether or not she would survive being sent to her home country you know, is, uh, it, it would, was an enormous concern for us. So we've, we're, we're unfunded at this point. We're, we're building, um, we're trying to build partnerships with you know, uh, pro bono law firms, law schools, um, you know, to meet these needs that we're seeing um, increasingly just based off of the referrals we're getting. We're getting referrals from the mayor's office. We're getting referrals from Legal Aid Society. We've worked with Catholic Charities to do, um, you know, an emergency case where instead of having um, a child detained for six months, we filed, we found out that they were going to be detained on their 18th birthday, filed, the case was uh, assigned to a to a fairly favorable judge, and the ch and uh, the child was was released that day. So these you know th this uh, these efforts of of getting into federal court and getting into federal court in a timely manner um, <coughs> it, it is uh, primarily what we're focused on. But then also uh, we're seeking with our community partners to not have to ha respond to these emergencies. So developing you know um, <coughs> developing practices for for going into um, Check-ins because we're seeing an, an enormous number of people that are being detained, you know, when they're going when they're going in for for check-ins because they're you know on a final order and have an order of supervision. Um, but so that's the that's the mo model that we're we're trying to build, uh, and you know, to make this sustainable, we obviously need to get funded. Thank you. That's the and this is the question mark, the multi-million dollar question at the end of the day. Sarah, I'm, I'm gonna let you you, you want to say. Yeah, I don't, I thank you again for having us here today and thank you to all of our community partners for all the, the great work that everybody is doing. Um, I don't have much to add to what Gregory um, has already spoken about. I will say that, you know, we are a new project and I think the city council has been quite visionary in recognizing the need for um, funding new projects that can meet the needs of the community. 
And I think that um, our organization and the work that we have done since we began our organization and that we did previously while we were at the Legal Aid Society is a project um, that can really meet the needs of the community. And it's very, um, it's very encouraging and exciting to hear um, all of our community partners um, talking about how the community needs to be represented. And as Gregory said, we look forward to working with all of our community partners. Our particular project um, is necessary in order to be able to effectively use the federal courts in order to halt um, the practices, the unlawful practices of this current administration. That's the, word, that's the key word there, unlawful, and they are. And, and we just gotta use the courts and the justice system to call them out, and, and we will. And that's our history in the city, and that's what we're gonna keep committed to. Thank you all for your service and your work today. Okay, last two panels. Uh, this next panel, the Chinese American Planning Council, Carolyn Cowan, Kelly Sabatino, Coalition Against Smoking and Immigrant Communities, uh, Yuvin Kim, Korean Community Services, Danny Sa Salem, the Arab American Family Support Center, Tasfia Rahman from the Coalition for Asian American Children of Families, and then uh, Chisato Horikawa Jassi, the Japanese American Social Services, This is a full panel. Yeah, this is great. Okay, thank you so much for your patience. For um, every voice will be heard, and I'm thankful that you're here. Where, who wants to start? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your time today. Um, so my name is Chisato Horikawa, and I'm the director at Jazzy Japanese American Social Services Inc. Um, so I wanna briefly talk, want to talk about the healthcare needs among our Japanese clients. Um, so a lot of our clients don't have English proficiency and have low or moderate income. And they came from Japan where they have access to national healthcare. So when they came here, it's really confusing for them to figure out how to access to health insurance or healthcare system here. And we do our best to navigate them through health insurance system or like hospital systems here, but we want to ask for more support to, for us to better serve to the community. Um, especially now with the current administration um, trying to expand the public church, public church definition, a lot of community members are afraid of access to health care or health insurance. We actually had a few clients who came back to us after enrolling in health insurance, saying that they want to disenroll from the health insurance because they heard like they cannot apply for a green card. So there are a lot of misinformation around that issue, and we want to make sure that our community members have accurate information so that um, they can access to the necessary care, I feel, I, I believe that no one should choose the right to stay in this country or health healthcare needs. Um, so I, I would like to ask for your support to um, restore the funding for like, healthcare, healthcare related issues such as access, access health or immig immigrant health um, so that community-based organizations like us can provide better services to community members. Do you get funding from the city council or the mayor's office for any of their initiatives on the health side? Yes, um, so, so for this year we, we, receive, we have received the um, Access Health Initiative. Got it, thank you. That's gonna be helpful for us. Um, Okay, thank you, and and I think this just underscores the the need for 
community-based organizations that have started in communities with the question, would you, what do we need as a community? And you've built infrastructure around that, and that's where we plug in. That's how, that's how we can support our immigrant communities, is to support you. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Yujin Kim from the Korean Community Services. Uh, thank you so much today for your time, Chairman Chaka and members of the committee. Um, so as you know, KCS has been around for almost uh, more than 40 years and we serve primarily the Korean American population in New York City, um, but we also serve other immigrant populations. Um, today, I wanted to speak to you and ask for your support in reducing tobacco, tobacco use rates in New York City and in New York City's immigrant populations. Um, we had, um, I had uh, two of my colleagues, Dr. Feldman and Dr. Uh, Salcedo, speak about the coalition. And KCS was funded last year um, in fiscal year 2019 for this initiative. Um, so I wanted to speak to you about that and our experience. Um, so we were funded $30,000. Um, our initial ask was 85,000, however, um, with $30,000, we were able to conduct community outreach and education to raise awareness about the dangers of smoking in our community, as well as produce materials and distribute them um, so that they know where to come um, or where to go for help, for example, for us, um, so that we can link them to care. Um, uh, for us, because there is, um, for example, New York State Smokers Quitline does not offer um, Korean services in their um, tobacco cessation services, we link them to ASQ, the Asian Smokers Quit Line, um, which provides cessation services um, over the phone in four languages, four Asian languages. That's Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, and Korean. Um, so to give you a little bit of a background about tobacco use in the Korean community, um, so we're very um, heavily immigrant, right? We're 70% um, of Korean population in New York City is foreign born. Half of Koreans living in New York City um, have limited English, English proficiency, and we have one of the lowest insurance rates. So one in four Koreans. You have the, um, some, one of the lowest what? Insurance rates. Insurance rates. Yes. So only uh, one in four Koreans living in New York City do not have health insurance. So that proposed that um, creates a lot of uh, you know it exacerbates the problem for us. Do you have a sense of the eligibility of that population as well? What kind of eligibility? Yeah, any kind of eligibility for that population that you studied with the four percent. Um, the health insurance. Yeah, for health insurance. Um, is it because mm -hmm. and the reason I ask is. Uh, as part of what we're trying to figure out too is how we can support you to build the connection to legal services to, to, to take eligible members of the community and give them access to, mm -hmm. uh, do you have a sense about and the eligibility of the, of, of the Korean population here in the city? How many of them are, who are uninsured eligible? Uh, or some kind of insurance but they don't know about it, they don't have a lawyer to help them navigate it. Mm -hmm. We actually, uh, we do have funding, and we do have access health, and we, um, KCS has, you know, AC, and nav AC navigation program. So we do help, and we do outreach to let people know that they can sign up for insurance on the marketplace. Yeah, so we are working on that as well. Yeah. Um, so to finish, um, uh, I, I want to talk to you about one of the clients that I've, uh, you know, that I speak to and has helped. Um, he has told me, and this is a recurring theme, but immigration trauma is um, something that a lot of immigrant communities deal with. But tobacco use is a symptom and an illness of the immigrant experience, um, particularly for Koreans, because they come here, they experience immigration trauma, and they don't know how to deal with stress. And there's also taboo around mental health. So they rely, a lot of them rely on tobacco use. Um, for as a way, as an outlet, or as a way to relieve stress, and it's a vicious cycle. And they also are not getting the impor important information about tobacco cessation or tobacco use from the city. Um, so there's a lot of different barriers that we were able to identify, and it's really important that not just the Korean community, but all immigrant communities in New York City um, are given that information, the services, so that you know, we work towards health equity and you know, we reduce tobacco use disparity in New York City. So we, we thank you for your time. Um. Thank you. And I just, that's, that's an important thing to say too, is, is essentially we were saying that, that there's, there's essentially toxic stress in our immigrant communities that's causing 
our connection to increase in smoking. Yes, and it is both a cause and it also manifests yeah. as a And that's just an important thing to say and, and understand as well. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chairperson Chaka, um, and the members of the committee for this opportunity to speak today. My name is Kelly Sabatino. I'm the Public Policy Manager at Community Healthcare Network. We are a network of 14 federally qualified health centers, including two school-based health centers and a fleet of medical mobile vans to provide affordable, integrated primary care, behavioral health, dental, and supportive services to 85,000 New Yorkers annually throughout Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. CHN is also a member of the Coalition Against Smoking in Immigrant Communities, and uh, this year we are hoping to expand our tobacco and e-cigarette cessation services to address growing rates of tobacco use throughout the city, particularly among immigrant and limited English proficient populations. Currently, we do screen all of our patients for tobacco use and refer them to smoking cessation resources, but for a host of re reasons that have been um, cited by our colleagues, um, uh, actually connecting to and maintaining with these resources is difficult. So with city support, um, hopefully um, in the coming year, we plan to hire a tobacco use navigator to educate patients about the dangers of tobacco use and link individuals to linguistically and culturally appropriate cessation resources. The navigator will also conduct outreach among tobacco users and their family members during community events and workshops to connect patients to those appropriate resources. The tobacco use navigator model aims to bridge a gap uh, in access to and awareness of smoking cessation resources throughout the city. In 2016, um, uh, our colleagues at Charles B. Wong Community Health Center and NYU Langone conducted an intercept study surveying 250 self-identified Asian American New York City residents. The study found that only one in four smokers were aware of either the New York State Smokers Quit Line or Asian Smokers Quit Line as smoking cessation resources. However, those who did know about these resources were more likely to have attempted quitting smoking than those who did not. 63% of smokers who were aware of the quit lines had attempted to quit tobacco in the last year, compared with 42% of smokers who did not know about those services. These data support the need for greater promotion of existing resources, as well as increased funding for programs that empower peers to help patients navigate culturally and linguistically competent community-based support. We thank the chairman and the Committee on Immigration for their time today and look forward to continuing our work alongside City Council to decrease tobacco rates among immigrant populations throughout New York City. We also look forward to collaborating with the City Council to develop a comprehensive platform to bring better integrated health care to uninsured and undocumented New Yorkers. As discussed um, in our uh, testimony to the Committee on Health earlier this week, we believe that heightened coordination between New York City health and hospitals and community health centers such as FQHCs would make a material improvement to the city's care for underserved New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm this is this is your map? Yes. The, uh, awesome. So you're, you're really in every borough. Minus Staten Island. Except for Staten Island. Yeah. Hopefully okay, we got to get you in Staten Island. Soon, yeah. Uh, it's the it's the suburb of Brooklyn, and and so we care about Staten Island uh, for that reason. There's no Staten Islanders here on this side, so are, are anybody? Oh yes, that's right. I'm sorry. Okay, I forget that sometimes. Uh, this is great. Thank you for for sharing the map and uh, and and just kind of providing the the sense of access in, in communities. Thank you. My name uh, is Danny Salim, and I'm the Senior Director of the Anti-Violence Program at the Arab American Family Support Center. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Committee, for uh, the opportunity to meet with you today and, and represent the Arab American Family Support Center and the immigrant and refugee communities in New York City. So the Arab American Family Support Center, founded in 1994, uh, is there to serve the Arab Muslim and South Asian communities and all immigrant communities that come to us we promote well-being, prevent violence, prepare families to learn, work, and succeed, and amplify the voices of the marginalized populations. Our staff, uh, our actually center has grown over the past three years from four offices into eight offices citywide. So we are in Staten Island as well. So we are in all, bar in all five boroughs. So, uh, our staff speaks also grown from 50 staff to 76 staff, and they speak over 18 languages. Uh, and 30, over 30 dialects. Um, and that also would lead me to speak that 
uh, the growing number of the immigrant communities and their needs. So according to the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, New York City is home to over 3.1 million immigrants, uh, the largest number in, in, the, in the city's history. And the Arab Muslim and South Asian community are growing approximately 49% uh, of the immigrants speak English, less than very well. And uh, Arabic, Bengali are among the top uh, 10 languages spoken by foreign born. Um, New York City residents who do not use English at home. The New York City State De Education Department lists Arabic as the third most uh, common language after Spanish and Chinese among the English language learners in public school, with a steady increase in this uh, demographic since 2011. Uh, current estimates of New York City Arabic population increase uh, range up, uh, the, there was an increase up, upward of 100,000, uh, mainly over 40,000 in, in Brooklyn and uh, 20,000 in Queens. And the US uh, Census Department continues to reject uh, the uh, to reject the, the request of the Arabic community to be identified as Middle Eastern or North African, and uh, they always been <coughs> identified as white, which is inaccurate uh, representation of the community, and that would deprive them from a lot of resources uh, and uh, and uh, be identified as they as what they want to be identified as. Can I ask you to jump over to yeah, the to the requests? Because these are interesting, and I want to kind of yeah. ask you some questions about the the requests for for the city and the budget. Yeah, definitely. So, so as part of the request, we we are requesting the uh, expanding of funding of the adult literacy program to six million for the uh, culturally specific programs, and also restoring the six point three 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 hundred seventy five million to culturally immigrant uh, initiative that support the Arab Muslim and South Asian community. And also we consider all organizations despite their size for communities of color nonprofit stabilization fund. And most importantly to Are advocate- Did you receive that fund, the funding for the uh, stabilization grant? No, I don't think we, we do currently because- But, to, but you're to, asking us to re- To, to consider all, it. including the Arab, mm, our, our, the, the, our communities, uh, our organization. And also, most importantly, to really partner and increase and, and ad, uh, advocate for funding for census because a census came up this issue today a lot. Uh, there's a lot of fear in the community. There's going to be a lot of effort and resources to really engage the community and encourage them to participate in the census, and that required a lot of effort and time and energy and resources. Thank you for that. And, and, and really, uh, across the board, all the work, whether it be um, access to healthcare, um, anti-smoking campaigns, the message of census becomes an opportunity for coupling all these things that we're doing. But, and I say that in the same breath of, of we have to fund your census component too. It's not, you're already talking to them about cigarettes, let's talk about, or, or, or um, what are those things called, the vapes? Jewel, whatever, the, is that a brand? I shouldn't say the brand, right? Okay. <laughs> The vapes uh, that that it becomes a, that's something that's uh, com embedded into into the larger expansion of funding mm -hmm. as as we think about next year, and and so thank you for for m mentioning census and everyone's thinking about it and everyone's talking about it, which is exactly what what we're supposed to be doing now, especially as we get to April first, which is the one year anniversary not anniversary uh, lead up to next year. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I had good afternoon on here, but now it's evening. Um, my name is Tasfia Rahman, and I'm a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Um, thank you, Chair Menchaca, and the members of the Committee on Immigration and, and Committee Council for holding this important hearing. CACF is the nation's only Pan-Asian Children and Family Advocacy Organization and leads the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services to support those in need. We also lead the 15% in growing campaign, a group of over 45 Asian-led and serving organizations that work together to ensure that New York City's budget protects the most vulnerable Asian Pacific American New Yorkers. Um, campaign members uh, employ thousands of New Yorkers and serve hundreds of thousands 
of um, APA immigrants. And we are, our organizations um, are in the best place to provide the most quality, language accessible and culturally competent services. So investment in our organizations are in the long term cost effective. Um, so I have a, um, a number of asks, but for the sake of time, um, I will highlight, I'll add on to what Chisato and Danny had added about Access Health and NSF. Access Health is really important to make sure that communities that are at the margins of our society are reaching the education and outreach they need to get access to health insurance and health care. Um, NSF has been um, integral to the development and the growth of our organizations that often have a hard time um, uh, surviving in itself to provide services to our communities. Um, that goes to providing basic um, capacity building um, resources and also even financial services as well. Um, so the other uh, um, item that I'd like to hi highlight is uh, we asked to increase funding and provide oversight on the $60 million in annual bridge program funding promised by Mayor de Blasio in his 2014 Career Pathways Plan. We've been uh, connected with NYC. Is that that's the one that Jesse was talking about? Yes, yeah. we have connected with NYC EQC to talk more about. Um, and so while current city investment in bridge program focuses on skills building and career development, um, it doesn't consider the population based needs, particularly of APA immigrants. And our community is heavily immigrant with 78% of them being foreign born. Um, immigrants also comprise 47% of the workforce in New York City and an estimated 1.7 million New Yorkers are limited English proficient. Job seekers with limited or no English proficiency who do not meet the requirements for intermediate or advanced proficiency are often included from current bridge programming. Therefore, we urge that a significant portion of the 60 million be used to fund an innovative, innovative pilot immigrant workforce development initiative with a focus on integrating pre-literacy and basic ESL classes with vocational ESL classes, literary, digital literacies, skills training, and student support services. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Carlin Cowan, and I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer of the Chinese American Planning Council. My apologies for my lateness. I was testifying at the Education Committee hearing as well. Thank you for still taking me. <laughs> Every uh, voice will be heard. <laughs> CVC is the nation's largest uh, social services agency for Asian Americans, serving over 60,000 Asian American immigrant and low-income New Yorkers each year. I would like to support all of the asks of Plastia and CACF, which uh, CPC is a proud member of. Um, and then I would like to discuss uh, a couple more things, which I will start with a story of one of our community members. Um, you may or may not know that Chinese Americans have the highest rate of, as, of asylum applications um, in New York City. And one of our community members was uh, trying to apply for asylum and came across a broker similar to a notario that offered a speedy asylum process and then took her information, took her story, took her photos, and copied it over to many, many other asylum applications. And even though hers was real and true and was accepted, the fact that it was then falsified on other applications meant that her case was called into question and we are fighting to keep her in the country now. This is a story that is just one of many, but it highlights the need for many different services impacting immigrants that have been talked about already today, adult literacy, funding for the census, and legal services, which is the one that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about in my remaining time. Um, if you saw the Comptroller's recent report on immigration court cases, you'll know that Asian Americans were the largest group represented in all active immigration court cases and that Chinese Americans represented a full 20% of them. Yet, despite the fact of this and despite the fact that CPC serves community members from 40 different countries speaking over 25 different languages, there is not a legal services provider for Asian Americans in New York City or specifically dedicated to them. This is a huge gap and community-based organizations such as CPC and many others you have seen today are struggling to connect our community members to these services and provide wraparound supports. This is a urgent issue that it becomes more urgent by the day and um, we hope that this is something that the city will put effort and attention and funding into addressing so that stories like the one that I shared do not continue to be as commonplace as they are. 
thank you for for that. And I, I don't, or, or I should say, as you present the um, the the issue, the 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 gap of service, and really thinking about a legal service provider that's dedicated to the API community, the or or other any other community. I'm really gonna I'm really the, I'm gonna look at you all to help develop that solution so that we can take it to the city through the city process to fund it because I, I think we're not good at rightly so developing solutions without you at the table or at least that's that's my point of view and so that 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 rang is is a very important thing to stop and acknowledge and so how do we think about building the apparatus for for the Asian community in the city. And so let's let's work on that together. And the last thing I want to say about census, as we call our last panel, is a better census uh, response gets us more funding for all the things we're talking about. And that's what's at stake here, which is why I'm going to say it at every panel and hope that you can commit to that work as we advocate for the 40 million, but also once the 40 million is out there, that, that we do it and we do it well so we can get our, our community out there. Immigration question or not? Cool, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, our last panel, um, I don't see the number of people here, so we'll see, but I think I see Jessica. Uh, come on over. <laughs> um, Chelsea Goldinger, Greg Waltman, Carrie Brody, and Shirley Solomon. Thank you so much for uh, for being part of our last panel, our most special panel. And uh, to close it off. Um. You want to you want to testify as well? Can you do you want to do you want to read her testimony or, or well, yeah? Yeah, just I won't ask any questions of you. Uh, but let's get you to fill out a form. The Sergeant of Arms will get, get that to you. Okay, and let's start with Jessica, por favor. Red, the red light is on and then you're good. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Franco and I'm here uh, representing the Mexican community, more so an organization of Mexican professionals under the name of We Are United. Um, and we're coming here with two concerns. Uh, one is uh, we are asking that the the Immigration Committee looks into um, allowing uh, immigrants who are eligible to work, immigrants who have a work permit to join the civil workforce, such as the NYPD, the FDNY, and uh, corrections. Um, New York City takes pride in being a sanctuary city, but it's not really that way, right? Uh, we don't really support the immigrant community when it comes to the workforce, when it comes to education and housing. Um, there are other cities in the U.S. who are actually uh, really, lead really leading the way, such as uh, Chicago, Los Angeles, Hawaii, Vermont, Nashville, and so on and so forth. So uh, we're, we're asking um, the New York City Council to really uh, look into this matter. Um, you know, I, I know that w with the NYPD, there's, there's the question of the firearm, but maybe we can start with the fire departments, right? They don't carry a firearm. Um, it really impacts uh, the immigrant community, especially the Mexican community, which is the third largest uh, nationality growing in New York City. Um, unfortunately, we have the highest high school dropout rates. Um, and one of the reasons uh, is, is because the Mexican youth uh, don't really connect to, um, they don't see any role models that they can identify themselves with or, or connect to, right? And clearly when we look at the civil workforce and the representation of the Mexican community, um, in the NYPD is made up of 35,000 members, but less than 60 are Mexican. In the FDNY, we only have one Mexican firefighter. So clearly is, is, it's almost like, you know, a, a, uh, a lost way for the Mexican community, for the immigrant community. So we're asking the Immigration Committee to look into it. Um, 
as well as uh, with uh, the workforce and education. Um, the summer youth program is not open for students who don't have legal status. So currently, um, middle school and high school students who don't have a social security number um, or work permit are not able to participate in the summer youth program. We're asking, again, the Immigration Committee to please uh, run an investigation and, and, and really come up with a plan to make the summer youth program accessible to all New York, all New York City students, regardless of their immigration status. Um, it is very difficult, and it's unfortunate to put this burden on a young kid who doesn't have any control over their legal status. Thank you for all those uh, recommendations, and I think a lot, some of these pieces can get uh, addressed through more funding to do the kind of outreach and connection, and some, and many of these are structural issues that we need to figure out and how to how to change policies so that we remove barriers, especially for our young people. And when we think about our services, and I want to say thank you for being here and representing the Mexican community, but also uh, the services community, the service community of NYPD and FDNY and corrections. And, and so I, I hear you, I hear you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilman Menchada, for your time. Last but not least, my name is Greg Waltman, uh, G1 Quantum. We specialize in a different types of proprietary innovation um, I'm also one of a lesser known candidate for governor of New York, still pending litigation, but I'm not here to talk about that. Um, but I, I wanted to try to use types of innovation to try to unpack some of these issues. And um, before I begin, I'd like to say what my last Moya friend here, estos personas son del mismo tipo, son del mismo sangre, so we all are kind of the same people. And as I, as I switch back to English, because I don't know that much, you know, of, of Spanish, but um, there's a little known solution to some a majority of these issues. If you put solar panels on the border wall of 2,000 miles at 10 feet on the southern side, you can create some 242 trillion kilowatt hours of energy, which is some $291 billion of energy per year. And if you're able to export energy to Latin America for cheaper, where on average Latin American citizens spend on average 20 or 25% more in energy prices, you're able to reduce the barrier to entry to participate in the global economy and thus resolve chain migratory issues and the buildup that uh, Homeland Security Christian Nielsen has taken quite a bit of hit for because the scope of her latest uh, hearing is limited to the value-based protectionism of the available solutions. So, so what I mean by that is that these solutions exist, solar wall solutions, quantum tracks, other types of solutions, but due to the media merger type of um, Cuomo contortionism, they're not being readily addressed in, in the type of way that uh, can create the type of reciprocity or synergy with the city council's office where you're, you know, you're articulating that you have 300 or $3 billion surplus this year, but you still have $20 billion in value-based legacy state debt in New York. So when you're looking to tax more people on uh, different types of MTA, other types of things, um, you know, these solutions do exist and reallocating resources, revenues that are generated from the solar wall application back to New York is, is of little or, or no, um, you know, wouldn't be, wouldn't be very difficult to do. And, and I'm just here today just to expand the value-based kind of protectionist conversation around these issues because, you know, people are getting hurt and these, and people resort to types of primitive types of ways when they're contracting um, immigrants and other types of things. And when you have the resources available, you know, is there, is there you know, a need for that type of animosity? No. So, so I'm just here to try to expand the conversation, let you know that there's more than meets the eye and, and understand and break down some of these complex issues within DC as it relates to these solutions. Thank you for that and for just bringing a, a context of a national conversation about things that are happening right now. Um, 
the last thing I heard, I don't think that there's been solar panels being proposed on, on Trump's wall, but I think what it makes me think about is what we're doing here in renewable energy um, uh, infrastructure and thinking about how we bring wind farms to the coasts of New York and that's happening in my district and, and that those are job opportunities that we're gonna connect and part of what we have been talking about today is how we make sure that immigrant communities who are not connected to those kind of job markets traditionally and because of barriers like language, uh, all those things get removed. And as a city council, we look at city as a way, but thank you for expanding the view here and thinking about other things at, at, at the same time. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. Finish us off here and, <laughs> and with, your, with your testimony. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Chaka, members, staff of the Committee on Immigration. Um, thank you for all the important work you've been doing this afternoon, your time in office, all of your work. Um, thank you. And for allowing me to share a bit more about our work this afternoon. My name is Zach Malik, but I'm testifying uh, on behalf of Carrie Brody. So if the language is a little off, this is her testimony. Um, I'm the founder of Emma's Torch. Emma's Torch is a nonprofit social enterprise that provides culinary training and job placement services to refugees, asylees, and survivors of human trafficking. We aim to reimagine how refugees are integrated into our society. Through our hands-on culinary apprenticeship, tailored mentorship, and job placement services, we prepare our students for sustainable employment in an industry where their culinary heritages can be celebrated. On behalf of the refugees, asylees, and survivors of human trafficking in our program, as well as our community partners and the employers who we work with, I urge you to consider supporting our continued effort to ensure that the newest members of our community are empowered to begin new careers with upward mobility. Our program offers 600 hours of paid on-the-job culinary training, job readiness classes, and English as a new language to our students. They learn on-the-job skills at our restaurants. We currently have a restaurant in Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn, and we operate the cafe at the Brooklyn Public Library Central location. We work with over 35 nonprofits, refugee resettlement agencies, and homeless shelters who refer clients into our program. Upon graduating from Emma's Torch, we help our students find jobs in a wide range of restaurants. We see our work as empowering our students to provide a vital service to New Yorkers. At our restaurant, we offer delicious, nutritious food to our community. But more than that, we help to ensure that there's a strong and diverse workforce to support the culinary sector. Restaurant owners of varying sizes struggle to fill their kitchen with dedicated and talented staff. We assist them with this. Our students are therefore not employed through a sense of charity, but through a real appreciation of the value they bring to the table. Often when refugees come to the United States, they struggle to survive. With your help, we can ensure that they thrive. I started this organization two years ago. In that time, we have scaled up significantly. Currently, we are set to enroll 70 students in our program this year. To date, 96 of our job-seeking graduates have began careers in the culinary industry upon graduation. With your consideration of our funding request, we can further invest in our students and help to ensure their success. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for uh, uh, the final testimony. And the, um, just wanna say thank you to the staff. Uh, I think Moya's here too as well. Thank you so much for, for being here and to taking back the notes. Uh, this, 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 the, strong, the strong will of the people's voices were heard today. Um, I want to thank the staff here uh, who have been incredible uh, in helping prepare for this hearing. It's not easy to, to do this because of, of the incredible need and how we want to think about how we make decisions. Um, and yeah, I think, <laughs> I think that's all I want to say about that uh, because we have to make some decisions soon and you've really helped us uh, expand the view but also commit to the things that we're trying to commit to to support uh, some of the more vulnerable people that live in the city who are truly the backbone of our neighborhoods. Um, and whether they're, whether communities that are just coming uh, to New York as immigrants or, or long-standing immigrant communities that have been here for a long time, and all of them deserve an opportunity. Um, but what, what it struck me the most about today's hearing was really the th thinking about, we have to make decisions about where we put funding. and. It is our prerogative as a, a, a government that's for the people to support the most vulnerable people. And I think that's how we have to make decisions. And that's what I want to be taking back to the council members, our, the speaker, uh, and the mayor, that that's how we make decisions because we, we don't have an infinite amount of money, uh, of funding, but we do have 
integrity to that, that goal. And if we all believe that, then we can make some decisions. And part of what we discussed today are, is that. Uh, some of the most vulnerable communities experiencing some of the most high risk family separation and everything that comes with it. Um, and the final thing I wanna say is uh, uh, Jin Lee here uh, is leaving us to move on to bigger and better things. And so we, we wanna make sure that we, um, we say thank you. We're gonna miss you. Uh, you prepared a, an incredible hearing. And with that, uh, you can gavel us out and do our final gavel uh, as a sign. Oh wait, and we're gonna we're gonna take a picture of this. This is a special moment. We're gonna we're gonna lose a very important person here. Uh, okay, and the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs> Thank you.